Hello, welcome to the September 14th, 2021 Club Cubase live stream. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick audio test to make sure everything is coming through on my end as expected. Bear with me just for a moment. Hello, welcome to the... Okay, sounds like everything is fine on my monitoring computer. My name is Greg Undo. I will be the host for the live stream today. I work as a employee for Yamaha Corporation of America, basically focusing on Steinberg products in the United States. And I'll be the host for the live stream today. I'm presenting from outside of the Washington DC area in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, so if you have not attended a Club Cubase live stream before, how it works is you can ask questions in the chat field, or you could just simply submit questions in advance via email to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Um, we will try to get through as many questions as we can, as completely and succinctly as possible. My ability to answer questions may fall behind the live chat, so I'll apologize in advance. But uh, just if you don't see an immediate response to your questions, if we could just try to be a little patient, I'll try to get through all the questions in order. Uh, if you don't have an immediate response, you know, also, you know, if we could try to refrain or to avoid asking the same question over and over again, that would be appreciated. That just kind of slows down the whole process. Um, as we ask questions, if you could specify which version of Cubase, whether it's Cubase Elements or Cubase Pro and uh, which level, uh, you know, if it's you're running Cubase 11 Pro or Cubase 10.5 Elements or which operating system, that information sometimes is helpful when uh, for me to help answer a question. Uh, I want to give a quick uh, shout out to a couple people that help quite a bit. And a lot of these people just kind of volunteer their time. So we're grateful for all the wisdom that they share. So um, we have two moderators that kind of make sure that everything uh, is kind of in order. And if we have anyone that's trying to sell weird services, they'll kind of take care of that and keep the discussion on track. But I want to give a special shout out to Jazz Dude and Agent K. They're just uh, people within the community who spend a lot of time to make it a better community for all. So just a special thanks to them. Jazz Dude also has the uh, wonderful resource for doing, for finding different tutorials uh, in the Cubase Nation Discord. So if you're looking for additional tutorials outside of the official Steinberg channels, you could check out the Cubase Nation Discord and Jazz Dude spends a lot of time compiling information there that's of great use to our community. Uh, we will have an index of all the topics with timestamps of hopefully available later tonight, uh, which will allow you to so all the topics that we discuss in the live streams. But if you wanted to search for topics covered in previous live streams, uh, we could thank uh, Jan from Stockholm, who does the cubaseindex.com site, where you could just basically type and it'll search through like um, probably almost 13,000 questions that we've covered. I, I've lost count uh, uh, in the live streams. Uh, so that's a wonderful resource to kind of get started with. Uh, and if you're attending the live stream live, tell us who you are and where you're from. And also, if you could indicate if this is your first time you've attended a live stream, let us know that as well. It's always wonderful to have new attendees. Uh, but we'll go ahead and I'll get my chat field kind of blown up here and we will get started. Okay, so we see Jay from Connecticut. We have Uno Memento from Finland. Matt Elliston from London. We have Filter Freak from South of UK. Okay, so we see a question from Jay. Hi, Greg. Uh, could you use some clarification if you don't mind? I was under the impression that Immerse uh, was needed for Ambisonics, uh, but did I understand what I need for Atmos Binaural? Um, so, you know, it really could um impression so I, i'm not sure if you're talking about the immerse uh vr uh program but you know you could do and you know you could do just straight uh ambisonics stuff without immerse so but you know it, you could say that you know ambisonics and dolby atmos are kind of considered immersive and that it's like 
surround, you know, sound that goes around your head. But if we have a particular audio file, if you want it to be immersive, uh, if you wanted to do it, you know, again, we could just come over here, we can add an audio and we could set its output configuration uh, here to be, uh, so if it's just, if you wanted to come here and now as we look at, let's say the mix console, we have our immerse channel that now we could just come over here and be able to, you know, if we have this going to like an immersive output, we could have our uh, 3D panning. So I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to, Jay, but just let us know. All right, so we see Sable Winters on a button. We see Sir Robert who wants people to smash the like button. So if you learn a new tip or trick, make sure that you do hit the like button. And we have we also see Terminal Nuclear War. Uh, we see Jazz Dude. Uh, we have Robbie Bowling from, and from Dallas and Tim Weinheimer. Okay, we have Dallas LaRue from Las Vegas. All right, we have Jan from Stockholm. All right, we have uh, Mark checking in from Nairobi, Kenya. And John Costigan from Kenosha. Okay, so I just see from uh, Dallas LaRue, is there any way I can add my samples from Splice directly into the media bay? So, you know, it, if you wanted to just come over here, I'm not that familiar. I think Splice is kind of like a rent to own, but as long as it's on your computer, um, you could, you should be able to, and I, I don't work with Splice, unfortunately, but if I just wanted to come here, you could go to this computer. So if they're actually on your computer, you could now just come over here and say, okay, I just wanted to find, uh, you know, my audio files that are in a particular, let's say, I just wanted to come here and they're in this particular folder that I could just kind of uh, click right here in this particular folder. And then if you wanted to just choose to rescan uh, the disk that at this point you could just say, okay, I'm looking for, you know, audio files within this particular folder. So you could just add uh, the particular folder that you see here um, and then Let's just set this to all ratings. So now any folder that's on your computer, you could access from the media bay and you could do that in the larger media bay. Or if you wanted to just immediately go to uh, the right zone media bay, you could just click on file browser and be able to kind of search. So as long as the audio files from Splice, if you have them actually on your system, uh, you should be able to have those accessible, any audio file accessible directly from Media Bay, but just uh, just tell it to look in the file browser and go directly to that particular folder. All right, so we have uh, Roland Klein checking in from uh, Kalmar, Sweden. We have a lot of Swedish people always wanted to go there. All right, and we have Soren in Sweden as well. All right, Reg Edits saying hello, and we have Trans 202020 from Berkshire. Uh, so we just see, is it possible to do scale and tuning detection of custom scales and tuning? Um, so I'm not sure if it's for audio or MIDI. This is a question from Taylor Sapp. Uh, but if it's going to be uh, for audio or MIDI, so if it's going to be, but within custom scales. So if you if we had MIDI data, so let's say if I come to a particular uh, MIDI or instrument part. So uh, as I just kind of double click, let's say, um, so we could have the scale assistant here. And if you've, perf if we have 
some MIDI parts here. So let's say if I have this, we could, um, you know, just look at this particular and have it automatically do scale suggestions for us. So, you know, if I wanted to come over here, um, you know, if I wanted to say, okay, we'll do this is, you know, A flat major. So as we want it to, you know, do different scale suggestions for different pieces of music, it could, it could do that. Um, so, but if it's doing different tunings, so, you know, the scale direction works, detection works for MIDI, but it's not necessarily going to, you know, work for audio. So if we want it to set up, you know, particular scales, if you go down to the bottom, you could also set up kind of custom scales here. Uh, but if it's doing tuning, like currently, like the pitch detection for very audio would be using... Uh, be based around 440 hertz. So at that point, you should be, you know, it's not going to do, um, you know, 15 tone scales or stuff like that. So if you could let us know, Taylor, if it's for MIDI or for working with audio, that would be helpful. All right. And we have Michael Pierce checking in from, from uh, German or from England. And we see Reg Edit from London. All right. Okay, so we see uh, we have Taylor Sapp saying uh, in Cubase 1102 Pro, when using very audio colors to chord track, I'm seeing red, blue, and dark blue. I uh, know what red and blue mean. What does the dark blue mean? So generally, let's let me just jump to another project here. So generally the dark blue means that it falls within the particular defined chord, but the chord is not within the scale. So if I want to come over here, let's say to a project, uh, when let's come over here to, I'll do just generate a chord track based on that. So let's say if we look at, um, Let's say if I switch this to uh, from an E minor chord to an E major chord. And we look at our very audio. All right, so I'm just gonna find where we just made that change. This looks like measure nine. Okay, so now we could choose to colorize uh, our s based on the chord track. So let's say if I move this particular uh, note here. Um, let's see if we could show it here. Just define the chord. So let's say here we are in, let's say our chord will be C sharp. So, but generally what the dark blue means is that it falls within the chord tone, but the chord tone may not necessarily fall within, let me just set the scale here. Um, but yeah, so it's changing the scale here, but it's basically when the, uh, when you see the dark blue, when it follows the chord tone, but the chord tone, the chord itself, the voice of the chord it doesn't fall within this the defined scale. That's what it means. All 
All right, so we have uh, Toon Van Tattenhove from Holland. Thanks for joining us. All right, we have Jeff, Jeff Zabelski from California. Okay, so let's see. Uh, so I just see when I take a bass groove on a single note and have it follow the chord track for roots, it often plays fifths instead of roots. Any idea why? So let's see if I could recreate that. fine rough key of this song all right so let's say right here we're gonna be in a flat so So let's say starting right here, we'll add a chord track. And it could be based on material, like the material that's already there and what it's, you know, if you have like it playing a major chord, uh, you know, if you're doing like the thirds and stuff like that, that it may uh, not, may move to within the chord tone, but let's go to give it a try. So let's say, We'll add a chord track here. So we're gonna have different. Okay, so let's say. And it's probably a B flat. It's right there. Okay, so let's say now I want to come over here. I will say follow root notes. All right, so let me just. So let's see if we come over here, let's get, just get to the very audio. And let's just change these chords here and see if they So now when I do this, so it's going to be kind of, you know, trying to work with the root note, but depending upon what other voices that we see within the particular chord can also be a factor of it. So I think it tries to stick to the root, but, you know, depending on if you're doing, you know, very complex uh, bass parts that it may not follow. But as I just come over here, let's say if we just transpose... We can see that as I transpose that the notes here will just kind of change accordingly. So if we go. So it may not just make everything the root note, but it'll probably just kind of change and try to keep it to the root note. Uh, but generally, again, it's a little more flexible with MIDI over audio stuff.
All right. So we just see from uh, Michael Pierce, really hoping we might uh, hear more about ambisonics uh, and Atmos possibilities. So I think, you know, question was that Michael had sent in last time was, you know, how to kind of work with, uh, so let's say, you know, how to, you know, if you need it to have kind of encoded stuff to works with ambisonics, but let's say if I just want it to come directly to a new project and let's say I want to add uh, an ambisonics output in my audio connection. So I'll just come right over here to, and we'll go to more and we'll just say, okay, let's add a third order ambisonics. And I wanted to take just maybe even a voice part so we could hear this. And I'm not sure if this is gonna translate to over uh, across for the presentation, but let's say I will import an audio file. Okay, so now what I want to do is let's send this to our ambisonics output. And as we do this, uh, let's say I'll just come over here to my audio connections. I'm going to right click and let's set this as the main mix. So now once I go into, you know, my mix console, we could just come right over here and let's say, okay, as we're doing this, I could take this particular track, um, and you could just kind of do all of the panning. And what you could do is just kind of use the, uh, once you do this, you can go into the phones and then you could use the Ambi decoder. So, you know, if you wanted to set it up with head tracking or if you wanted to uh, just kind of to have your particular, so now at this point we could have this go out of the Ambisonics bus. And I think I have just like a quick little tiny post project that we could maybe look at for this. So if you wanted to take like this particular stream. So if we have head tracking on, we could set up the head tracking initially, but now I could just take this particular stream here and let's say as we do this, if I wanted to kind of pan it kind of behind, we can see kind of a top view of this. And if we wanted to move this in kind of a circle. So this way we're kind of mixing down to the third order ambisonics and monitoring in stereo because a lot of people aren't gonna have like proper ambisonics. So as I just wanted to kind of come over here, we could say, let's take this particular file. I, I want it to be in the top front. And at this point we could just choose to rotate kind of the rear view behind you, but it could be just any audio file. And then you could work with it in kind of ambisonics format. And if you need to do kind of more you know, stuff for Atmos, that's when you'd need to get into Nuendo for, you know, doing all of the Atmos support for that. Just finding my spot. All right, so just see. Um, so we just see a uh, question, how to make reverb and delay bus permanently for each project. So a lot of people when they do this may just start off with a template. So let's say if I just want it to, uh, we'll come here, I'll do activate a new project. Just do new project here. Sorry about that. 
Okay, and now I wanted to just add uh, two different effects channels. So I would come right over here. So I'd say, okay, we're gonna add uh, our effects channel. And I just wanted to add, let's say a multi-tap delay. And let's add another effects channel. And I want this to be a reverb. So let's say revelation. All right, so now if I wanted to save this as a template, I would just say, let's uh, click on save as template. And I would say, we'll call this September 14th. Okay, so I'll call it September 14th, 2021 FX. So now when I go to a new project, I could just come over here to more and then I would just see this and I every time I start a project I could start off with that template and that will include my effects channels that will be in there so just set up like a template and then you could start every project with you know starting from that template and your reverb and delay will be in there Okay, um, so you see from uh, James Bond, if I freeze MIDI modifiers, it is it also writing automation to MIDI event. I don't want that to happen. So let's say if I come here to, uh, so if you're just doing, you know, it depends if if you're doing automation or if you're doing MIDI CC data. So if you're doing MIDI CC data, it's automatically going to be part of the event. So, you know, if, but let's say if I have an instrument track, so let's say we'll just do a quick retro log here. Okay, so let's say I have my one note, my minimalist composition here. Uh, and let's say if I have volume automation. Okay, so I will just select this event and we'll do freeze MIDI modifiers. So uh, the automation um, isn't, will be, moved with the event but it's not embedded within the event so let's say if i uncheck automation follows events so and we look at the data here in our list editor we're gonna i think we should only see the one particular note so if we open up the list editor we have our one midi note message so it will embed you know your midi effects it will you know if you have midi cc data for volume or modulation or expression that will automatically be included in the MIDI part, but doing the freeze MIDI modifiers doesn't include automation. So if that's the type of automation that you're referring to, it won't include that. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, if I want to capture the boomy EQ curve of a male voiceover uh, after it was transposed down to Darth Vader territory, can I apply that curve to the same file at a normal pitch? And uh, will that not work? Um, so if you wanted to kind of, you know, if you had different voiceovers, so let's come back here. Let's say I'll just have a quick voiceover file that we could probably just use again. So let's say if we start here and let's say, okay. Chance to think about the history. So say I'll just take kind of some different regions here of maybe different people speaking. I asked you that question of Victor Lane and you said it's a little too soon to think about that. Okay. So let's say I'll just take this particular file. Um, 
And let's say as we play Ask this, I just wanted to transpose it down. So let's say I want it this. We'll try like a perfect fifth down. Ask you that question, Victor. Ask you that question, Victor. Ask you that question, Victor Lane, and you sit there at Sonoma. Yeah, you know, it's it's still a tough one, right? Like, So let's say if I wanted to... Take this and let me just do a transpose here from. So let's take this. Ask you that question, Victor. For some reason this file isn't transposing. I'm not sure if it's. Right, Patel. Ask you that question, Victor Lane, and you said it's a little too soon to think about that. Have you had. All right. So let's say if I wanted to maybe apply that sound to another, you know, what you could try, Ted, is to just use maybe like. Uh, Let's say I'm going to send both of these to a group. And I'll just do my processing here. So let's say I want to take. Ask you that question, Victor Lane, and you said it's a little too soon to think about that. So I'm going to, on this particular track, you can use a plugin such as a the Curve EQ. I haven't used this in a while, but I think if we put it on. average here um and at this point we could say so let's go ahead and i'll just play this particular section and we'll loop it a couple times here ask you that question of victor lane and you said it's a little too soon to think about that have you had a ask you that question of victor lane and you said it's a little too soon to think about that all right so i'm going to label this as a take and if i wanted to take maybe a different voice part and get that same character i will come over here so scott Dix so scott dixon joining us now and uh this is i said so i interviewed him victor lane for sport okay so i'm going to do that as a take so i want to use the first one as a reference and apply it to this file so now as we play back oh and uh this is i said so scott dixon joining us now and uh this and So, and then we'll click match spectrums. So Scott Dixon joining us now. And uh, this is, uh, I said, uh, so, I so that will kind of allow you to do uh, like an EQ fingerprint. It may not get you the same result, but that's something that you could try, Ted, if you wanted to kind of capture uh, the characteristics, but probably doing the same pitch shifting process may get you there faster. All right, we see Mark Raven checking in from Montana. Okay, so we see, um, hi Greg, uh, one question. I was working on, my, on one of my songs in the mix. It sounded balanced, but when I exported, I got high peaks and low RMS, same in mastering. Song is twice quieter than others. Where is the problem? So a lot of times when you're, you know, perhaps mixing a project, um, so let's say I'll just jump here. This is a pretty complex project, but we'll take a listen to it. You know, so, and this is one of the areas where kind of the control room balance can give you a, a good sense of what's going on or the control room functionality. So let's say if we're here, you know, so a lot of people, when I, when I get this type of question, people are using their master fader as kind of their volume level 
Uh, but what we want to do is to use, try to keep the master fader close to zero dB and then build your mix around that. And if you're using this for your monitoring volume, use the control room volume because you can see that as I adjust my master fader here, that it's actually, if we look at our levels in the master fader right here, that we lose a lot of signal just by having that down. So if you're using this as like the monitoring volume, you can see that as I adjust my control room up and down, the gain structure of my mix isn't affected. So it's just solely my monitoring level. So a lot of times when we people are using their master fader as the monitoring level, you lose a tremendous amount of information. It's like you're throwing away like half of the signal, uh, you know, as you know, so, you know, you could say, okay, if you're down at minus 23 dB, you're losing 23 dB of gain. So if you're using that, you know, try to set your master fader and then, you know, adjust your speakers so that that's a comfortable monitoring level and use the control room uh, as the, you know, as the volume, the, you know, the volume level. So that, and this isn't tied to the gain structure of the mix. So let me know if you're doing that. Okay, so we see, hi, uh, can't seem to play my music to my speaker. It is connected with an audio jack from my computer to speaker, please help. So, you know, if you go to your audio connections menu, you, you know, first thing you wanna do is make sure that Cubase is set to communicate with your particular audio interface that you're using. So we wanna to go to studio to studio setup and we could look at the audio system and make sure, you know, by default on Mac, this may go to built-in audio. Uh, it may go to generic low latency on Windows, but make sure that this is connected, that Q and this will basically say Cubase is gonna send the audio out of, in my case here, the Steinberg UR24C interface directly so now that's what Cubase is communicating with. Now, if your audio interface has multiple inputs and outputs, you can just come here to the outputs tab or to a control room tab if you have Cubase Pro. Uh, and then you could just say, you know, this is going out of outputs one and two of my audio interface. So as I play, so if I have this going to outputs that aren't being connected to your monitor speaker, you may kind of see the level. So if you see the levels here of tracks, at that point, you know that Cubase is communicating with the audio interface, but if you're still not hearing it at this point, make sure that's going to the correct output, either in the control room, or if you have Cubase elements, Cubase artists, maybe in the output section, and then you should be able to hear it going to your speakers. Uh, so question, do I need Nuendo for ADR or can Cubase basically do the same job? So Nuendo is going to have specific ADR functionalities. So, you know, it could really depend on what your definition of ADR is. I would say if you're doing a lot of ADR work for a film, that it makes a lot of sense to do it inside of Nuendo because it's kind of a purpose built solution. Uh, there's a lot of programs that kind of use like the paradigm of comping tracks like for vocals or guitar solos. Um, but I think it makes more sense to kind of do it, um, you know, directly from the, you know, when we'll take a quick look. Uh, let's see if I have my project here real quick. Okay, so let's say. Okay, and let me just check my. Okay. 
All right. So let's say if I was doing kind of a post thing and if you're, you know, starting to get to point where, you know, you maybe envision yourself doing a lot of ADR work. So let's say, you know, we're, an ADR stands for kind of automated dialogue replacement. So let's say, you know, if I want to take this video of the girl coming in. Help me. And I wanted to replace where she said, help me. Um, so at this point, you know, with Nuendo, we could have, you know, additional uh, dial, we could have additional marker tracks. And these marker tracks could be imported from like a CSV file. So if we wanted to come right over here, we could say, let's go to um, our ADR panel. So, and I wanted to just come over here to dialogue. So I have a marker track for dialogue for a particular uh, actor. But now if I just wanted to come here and we could base this on like cycle markers. And what we could do is just say, you'll have different functions for dialogue inside of Nuendo. So let's say as we come here, um, you know, we could say, okay, when we go to our setup, you know, at this point we could say, okay, we could adjust like the amount of pre-roll, uh, you know, we could, you know, have it automatically, you know, record and enable the target track. We could have different headphone mixes. If we want the video to swipe to center, you know, or just do a countdown. So let's say as we come over here, instead of kind of having to do uh, a tremendous amount of work, I could just click right here and it could do a pre-roll, post-roll and automatically punch in. So I could say, let's just come right over here and let's rehearse the dialogue. So we see this yellow indicator. We could have the text for the di for the dialogue automatically embed it and rehearse that section. Help me. Let's come right over here and say, okay, now we wanted to record. Help me. And now we could review. Help me. And it'll just kind of punch in and punch out based on the left and right locators. If you're doing stuff for Foley, you could just kind of come over here and, you know, put it into free run and that will automatically just kind of keep going. So if you're doing Foley works, there's no real equivalent of this in Cubase. So if you're going to find yourself doing this, like, you know, if you do a lot of dialogue work, you know, like maybe if you're doing like a 30 second commercial and you had four lines, it could be something. But if you're doing like, you know, uh, thousands of different lines and replacing for a whole film and you need that continuity that the tools in Nuendo would be a better solution for that. Okay. Uh, all right. So we see from, uh, uh, so we have a question. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, Joseph K from LA. Uh, how can I change session tempo without changing an audio wave track in the session? So if we have uh, an audio track, so say if we're here, and I'll just quickly revert this back to where we were. So, you know, if the audio tracks are set to musical mode, then as we would do tempo changes. So right now, let's say our, our project's at 100 beats a minute. So if I just, by default, come right over here and say, okay, I want it to be 120 beats a minute, and we play. This could be, this will only change if it's set to musical mode. So if I select all of my audio events, I can now come over here and just say, okay, I don't want those into musical mode. So let's say if I just, and I'll just kind of revert this and start it over one more time. So just take the audio events out of musical mode. So I'll select all the events, we'll disable musical mode. And now, as I play, instead of them following the tempo, I could just type in the tempo and they're just gonna play back 
uh, you know, they're just going to play back the audio. So just make sure that none of the events are set to musical mode and then they won't follow the different tempo changes. So. Okay. All right, so we have Neurotic Nexus checking in from uh, Kiev in Ukraine. All right, we have Millard Brown checking in from Pennsylvania. And we have uh, someone else checking in from Finland. All right, so we see how to use the score editor to score a Groove Agent drum track. Uh, I'm having trouble with formatting the staff to look like a drum set chart. Okay, so let me just go to a particular project. Okay, so let's say in my, let's say I'll just put in like super generic drum pattern here. Okay, so let's say I want to now look at this uh, drum pattern here. Okay, so now what I want to do is to come over here. I'm going to select the part here. Let's go to, let's, I'm going to, so we'll select this. I'll select the top tab. Uh, we could come over here to the drum map. So we could have this automatically uh, create the drum map from the instrument, but let's come over here to the drum map setup. So I could say C1. I want this to be on F3. Uh, let's say D1. And I could change this to... Let's see that. And let's say our closed hi-hat, I wanted it to look like that. So we could change our node head shape and its display. So let's see if this is, this will show up in the right area. So I think now that we've set up kind of our in notes and set up the display notes, and again, to get there, you could just go to the drum map setup. So once we kind of have that done, let's take a look at the event in the score editor that now will come and say, So let's just Okay, so we'll come over here to the score drum map setup. Let's 
I haven't done this in a while. Um, but I think once you, So I think it's kind of in here where you could kind of set the voice as well. So let's say if I set this to so let's say I'll put those to one, two, and three. Um, if you want, I could, you know, I think that if you work with the drum map, let's see if. Let's see if we use a score drum map. That was something kind of, I know using, I could have a, I'll, I'll make a note to do it on Friday to have kind of a better answer to kind of show that. But I think, you know, make sure that the critical thing is when you go into uh, like the drum map here, that you have the different note head shapes here. So that's where a lot of people miss, but I'll, I'll play around and, uh, revisit it on Friday so we could uh, show you how to make a drum map quicker. All right. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, what do you think is the best wavetable synth uh, in Cubase? So I think, you know, I mean, Cubase, I don't think comes with a wavetable synthesizer, but if you get into Halion, um, you know, once you get into, let's see if it's even in uh, Halion, Sonic, but let's take a look. So I guess it's gonna be in Halion. So Halion itself will have its own wavetable synthesizer. So say if we just go here to Halion under the sampler, you could get into like Anima or other wavetable synthesizers, or you could actually create your own wavetable synthesizer. So if you wanted to now come over here to something like Anima, you could just say, okay. So if you wanted to come over here and kind of do your own wavetable synthesizer, if that's important to you, consider getting uh, Halion because um, that will come with. And then once you kind of get into uh, here, you could say, OK, I just wanted to go to, you know, you could add different wa a wavetable zone and have kind of full um, you know, wavetable synthesis going on and create your own wavetable synthesis. So you could just say, okay, you know, as you wanted to go to different uh, oscillators, but, you know, there's built in, or you could design your own wavetable synth inside of Halion. Okay, so we have a question from Millard Brown. Is there any shortcut I can use to reverse the locators when I fat fingered them to be backwards? Okay, so let's say if we have our left and right locators, um, and sometimes people will get these backwards. If you go to the transport menu, 
and then we'll see locators. And then here we could just say exchange left and right locator positions. So now when you see it orange, it's backward. Or if you wanted to, so again, just come right over here to locators and uh, exchange left and right locator positions. And I think there's a keyboard shortcut for this as well that maybe you could set. So exchange left and right locators under transport. So you could set up a key command if you do that all the time, but you know, probably doesn't happen regularly, but if it does, you could do that, but just exchange the left and right locator positions just right there. All right, thanks for all the great questions. If you've learned something new, make sure that you do hit the like button. All right, so we see a question, does anyone use Prolog? So, you know, Prolog is kind of, uh, I believe it's basically just kind of a scaled down version of uh, Retrolog. So when we look at this, uh, a lot of people have kind of migrated uh, directly to Retrolog, but you're still, uh, for legacy projects, you can come over here and still have all sorts of great sounds inside of Prolog, but it's still a popular synth, but a lot of people have kind of uh, migrated more to Retrolog, so, but maybe some other people could check, you could mention as well. Okay, so we have a question. Hi, Greg, is it possible to see the chord track in the score editor to print the chords for a musician's session? Thanks. So yeah, it's pretty easy to do. So let's come over here, let's jump back. So let's say if we have the chord tracks um, done for this. So let's say I extracted it and you know I wanted to you know, just come right over here. So let's say I'll look at my piano part in notation here so let me just sneak over to page mode so if we go to your scores and go to advanced layout just click on show chord track and then you know even if we just had um a blank part so let's say okay i, I want to make charts for people uh, at this point i could say okay let's add you know an instrument track I want to just take the entire part here and let's, we start with the blank score and now what I could do is just go to uh, my scores menu to advance the layout and just show chord track directly over and you could add slashes in if you wanted to uh, with different rhythmic notation options. So. That's a uh, kind of easy way to do charts for people. Let me see Mark Rabin saying, I found that in some of my sessions, I actually let the player see the project window and I enlarged the chord track so they could see the chords in time. So I do that for a lot of projects I play on. I'll just kind of go through and find uh, the chord track and I will just come here and just as I do tracking, I'll, I will just use this and find it just as easy as a traditional chord chart, but you know, if, depending on the musician, but this is also a very easy way to do it. All right, so see Mark Rabin is number 40 on the thumbs up, okay.
Okay. Um, so let's say uh, if I play a fast drum solo, uh, what to do if some parts are not perfectly aligned with tempo? Can Cubase have a fast method to make it perfect? I'm from India, so yeah, you could do it pretty easily, just you know, quantizing drums. Uh, but you know, if, I'll show kind of a whole process here if you wanted to figure out how to you know quantize drums but you know you know the a quick way is just to kind of take um you know if it's different things is you know cubase will find the hit points for you and then what you could do is you know let me just undo that so say i'm here um so you know we could have this kind of once we have kind of hit points determined for a particular event here so let's say um, at that point, you know, you could, you know, create, uh, regions, markers, you know, so you could do a number of different things. Let's say I wanted to come over here, uh, and let's create, um, create regions. And then if you wanted to just come over here, you could, you know, quantize So say, okay, I want to take all of these regions here that are kind of, you know, broken up and then choose to quantize. So let's say, okay, I want to make these all half notes and then just hit Q. Um, so you could also kind of, let me activate the project first. That would help. So let's say as we come here, let's adjust our threshold. And at this point you could just say, okay, I want it to, you know, you could create slices. And now when you come here, you could just say, okay, I want to quantize these slices. So you could do that pretty fast. Another method of, if you had to do like multi-track drums where maybe different parts are bleeding into each other, you know, what you could do is put them all into a folder. So we'll select our tracks here. Let's uh, right click and then you can say move selected tracks to new folder. So I have these in a folder already. I will double click and just kind of find my hit points. So let's say if we listen to just the drums with a click, we can hear how it's maybe not as tight especially when you get into like some drum fills. Like that snare fill was rushed. So I'm gonna find just kind of the rhythmically significant points of let's say kick, uh, snare. So again, we just kind of look at our part and we wanna make sure that we're not kind of necessarily including crosstalk channels, you know, tracks are bleeding through. So let's go to my hi-hat and I will just kind of come over here. So I've kind of found those three and now that they're in a folder, I'm going to enable group editing on the folder track. So we'll, now that I've done that, I'm gonna go to my quantize panel. So we could just come right over here and I want to say my kick is going to have uh, a higher priority and let's say I want a low priority or no priority for, so let's say my kick and let's say I want to do hi-hats. And what this will do is this will kind of place markers across all of the tracks. So, and why we do this is that now I could, you know, once we have this set up, this will just kind of place markers. And what I want to do is just to slice those audio events. Uh, and I'm going to say, we're going to set our quantize here to 16th notes. Uh, and I could have this do uh, audio warping, or I could just say, let's just go to our quantize. And now at this point, I could just quantize and then do crossfades. So what that's done is gone through every one of the different parts and will now, so we listen to our drums with. So 
So, and then everything can be just kind of cleaned up and, you know, just quantized based uh, directly in that. So this way, if you have a snare that's being heard in the kick mic or the hi-hat mic, all those different slices will be moved together. So, but, you know, for any audio event, just kind of select it, find the hit points, and then just quantize and you'll be in good shape. Okay, thanks for all the great questions. All right, so we have Redna Music checking in from Holland. All right. All right, so we have a question. Um, is there a way to reset one or all VCA faders to Unity without affecting the track they control? Um, so I think, you know, let's say if I have all of my drums set here, and these are now gonna be set to, uh, let's say these are all feeding into a VCA. All right, so say as we listen to So, you know, if we start at 0 dB, but if we wanted to bring these down So, you know, as we would bring it up, this, you know, would control. So, I think, you know, by sense that if you move it back to 0 dB that, you know, the channels are feeding into the VCA would uh, would automatically be reset accordingly so um, I, I think that kind of makes sense uh, but so I don't know a way to reset the VCA fader to unity without affecting the tracks uh, other than if you wanted to you know like Edit the link group settings and not use the VCA. Um, but I, you know, I think it, it does make sense. That, you know, the the tracks will automatically, um, you know, be it would correlate directly with the VCA if it's being fed. All right, so we just see uh, Taylor uh, is more, um, you know, on on the more clarification on his scale detection. Says listening to Indian music, I heard some quarter tones, and overall scale was a little flat in some notes and sharp in others. I was wondering how to recreate that scale. So if you go into like particular instruments, if you have VST 3.5 instruments, so let's say if I add, you know, you know, for MIDI, you know, audio would just be captured as whatever scale it is in. But let's say if I have this set to Halion 6 and because we're kind of not limited to a lot of the traditional paradigms of MIDI stuff, but let's say if I want to come, let's say world instruments here, and I want it to be, so let's say as I play. So once we go into the instrument, like let's say in the macro editor here, um, So I we could at this point um, let's see with the in here we could choose different scales so we could say okay I just wanted to uh, you know take different scales here so as I would play 
So we could just kind of take these different scales. So let's say, again, I turn them on. So let's say, okay, if I want to play. Traditional, but let's say if I wanted the uh, E to be. So we could lower it by a quarter tone here. So say on the G here, I just wanted this to be flat. And then let's change that back. So if you want a really flat, you know, A. So, but you see in, you know, some instruments, like I remember even going back to, you know, way back when my Proteus II, you could have different tuning temperaments. So different instruments may have different tuning temperaments that you could emulate. So, but, you know, one that comes to mind immediately to me is, uh, some of the instruments in Hallian, such as the, you know, when we look at it, the, um, you know, the world instruments here, you could do all sorts of cool stuff like that. But it's not automatically going to do scale detection. I mean, you know, and there's different scales, like, you know, 53 tone uh, scales and even Dorco will have support for even notating, you know, like, you know, 53 tone Turkish scales and stuff like that. It doesn't necessarily translate into Cubase, but you could emulate it with doing different music, uh, different tunings. And, you know, we could do different tunings here on, on independent notes of VST 3.5 instruments like, uh, Hallian six. All right, so we see, yo, why Cubase be costing an arm and two legs? So, you know, we have Cubase version starting at $99. So I think the full one is, you know, like $579 in the U.S. So I don't think that's an arm or two legs. Uh, but, you know, I think that one of the things that you'll see with Cubase is if you have Cubase that you tend not to buy, you know, with other programs you may have to buy, <clears throat> hundreds or thousands of dollars of extra functionality and third-party utilities to get the functionality that's included with Cubase. Okay, so we see, uh, hi, suddenly I'm getting heavy latency in Cubase 10.5 Pro when recording vocal takes using headphones. Can't continue. I have Scarlett 18 i8 uh normally that won't happen uh setting in cubase 10.5 maybe so you know one of the things you could do immediately is on the lower left hand corner of the transport just come over here and try to turn on constrained delay compensation what happens often is if you have different plugins on your system so let's say on my stereo out here uh, i have a multi-band compressor okay so now, as soon as I have a multi-band compressor, that's going to add a lot of latency. Now, if you have Cubase 10.5 Pro, you could come to the full mixer view here uh, and go to the upper right-hand corner, and you'll see this thing called channel where you could do the uh, setup window and activate the channel latency. And you could see in this little column right here, just go across all of your tracks, and we could see that in my master fader, because I activated this particular insert, that that adds 123 milliseconds of latency. So coming over to the, and when I look at this, let's say in a constrain, so let's say I'll just come over here. So you can see that this plugin is now on here, but when I constrain 
the delay compensation and we go to look at the track now with that particular plugin. So on my master fader, that will basically turn off plugins that are causing latency. So if you wanted to fix it with one click, try the constrained delay compensation. And this basically bypasses plugins temporarily that are causing latency that could be, you know, contributing to what you're running into. So try that. And if it's a software solution, you know that it's a plugin that's instantiated on the project that's causing the latency. So we see from Brynell that the Cubase updates cost money. So, you know, it, you know, we do have very specialized developers that spend a lot of time coming up with new products and new features. So all the software development isn't free. See, Logic has been consistent on pricing. They did, at some point, they did an update and you had to basically buy it over again, so. But remember that you had to buy a, com a, sp a specific computer with that as well. Okay, so we just see, uh, I think from Saeed, uh, two questions. What is the real need of normalizing? Uh, if I can compress or limit audio to get it louder, for what do I need to normalize? So often when you do uh, normalizing, so let's say if we wanna take a look at this particular file and maybe we're not getting, you know, there's diff just different methods of adding gain. So if I wanted to normalize this, and often when we go to normalize a particular file that we could set it to a particular level. So I could say, okay, I want this to be to, you know, minus three dB or to minus, you know, 12 dB. And now we could set that. Now, if you're doing like, let's say we did a final mix, we could also go to the loudness normalize here and say, I want that to be, you know, uh, for, let's say for Spotify, let's say minus 14 lofts. And I could just take that particular file and have it actually go to a target volume destination right here with normalize. Whereas limiters, you know, you can basically take it up to, you know, minus one dB, but, you know, it, depending on the source, you know, the audio may, you know, affect the gain of the audio differently uh, and it may add color. So they're just kind of different methods for kind of, you know, getting the audio louder and different approaches. And we could think of, you know, normalizing sometimes, you know, we could do this on the final stage just to get a known consistent level that's been predefined. Okay, just going through more questions. I just lost my space in the chat field. All right, so I may have lost a couple of questions. So, um, okay, but so I apologize with that. Um, so 
So we see that uh, Michael Teams is on the live stream. All right, so you see uh, from Redna Music, will Cubase have any hardware gear like Ableton with all those hardware controllers? That would be awesome. So uh, I think one of our hardware controllers, CC121, was just recently discontinued for parts shortages, part of the you know global parts shortages uh, supply. So you know that's kind of held up a lot of different things. There are also still available if you wanted a very expensive premium experience like you know you could get the yamaha nuage but you know cubase works very well with any existing midi controller through generic remote or mackie control already All right, so we see Daryl's uh, solution for fixing his controller, uh, sending uh, unwanted MIDI notes worked from the previous live stream. Thanks for letting us know. All right, so we see from Brian L, it's like, wow, I've not seen Retrolog in two years. Now it's nostalgic, so it's still a wonderful instrument. And yeah, there's always new features, especially with MPE support and stuff like that. All right, so we see, uh, I think this is with the latency question. So ah, I added Isotope master plug into the output channel while still recording, could be causing it too. So I think that would definitely uh, be a culprit. So we see uh, from Brian L, I miss m making music on Cubase, even if I have to sell mine and my car sold to get it. And so again, you could you know start at Cubase Elements and then there's different promotions throughout the year as well. So make sure you take advantage of that going on throughout the year. But you could start at around $99 in the US. All right, so we have a question uh, about volume. Is there a difference between elevating audio volume by automation and elevating it by changing the amplitude of the waveform on a track? Because I found the second way much more easier. So, you know, with automation, you know, is probably more suited if you have to do different volume changes, like, you know, this note is too loud or I want to do a perfect fade out. If you're just using automation to elevate the volume, you know, it's like, you know, the amplitude works great for that. But, you know, when you need to make, you know, a number of changes, you know, for let's take a look. Uh, if we need to make changes throughout a particular project, you know, or maybe this is too loud or too soft, you know, some people, some mix engineers, you'll look at their volume and, you know, they'll be like very precise, you know, like, you know, down a hundredth of a dB for this word, you know, so if you need to do constant changes like that, that's where automation makes more sense. But if you just need something louder, um, you know, like globally, but not, you know, like, you know, different volumes for different portions of the file then you could use like clip gain automation or normalizing. But again, you know, when you want to have changes to change the dynamic levels, that's where automation makes more sense.
So just seeing uh, from Taylor Sapp, it says, um, so Mark Rabin got me thinking, and he had a question about the tuning for like an Indian piece of music. Uh, maybe I could extract a vocal and convert it uh, into MIDI with pitch bend data. It might give me what I would need. So that will give you kind of a sense of, you know, w how it looks in kind of more of a Western scale or just to be able to isolate it with something like the Spectral Airs Pro. All right, so we see Brian L just talking about the price rising in Cubase. So really, I think it's maybe gone up twenty dollars in the last uh, twenty years. So it hasn't in the U.S. at least. So I'm not sure what it is in all markets. Okay, so um, I just see, hello, hi, is there a way to record from my digit, digit act to Cubase? It has MIDI and audio over USB, but I need to open up eight tracks and route them one by one. So let me just look what, uh, what that device is really quickly. See if I can find it. Bear with me just a second. Googling it on my other computer. Okay. Make sure I get the spelling right on it. Okay, so, um, all right, so it looks like an electron uh, drum synth. So let me look at some pictures of it. All right, so I'm just kind of looking at some pictures of it. Um, all right, so it looks like if it records, you know, some devices, um, you know, if the driver for the for the DigiCat or Digit Act, um, you know, if it does MIDI and USB, MIDI and audio over USB. Um, but I need to open eight tracks and route them one by one. So, you know, I know that many of the Yamaha keyboards will have their MIDI and USB drivers and a driver will be a multi-channel. So you could capture 16 tracks or 16 stereo tracks of MIDI as audio. Um, so if, if the, uh, if the, if that device does not allow you to do multiple tracks, with the USB driver, and that would be a limitation of the device, and not Cubase by any mo by any means. Uh, but if that allows you to do it, you could set that up in Cubase. But many of those will just allow you to do just a stereo out and MIDI. So you know, but it can be done. But it, if it doesn't, if you don't see all eight inputs, uh, that would kind of lead you to think that the driver is not designed to do that. But you could just simply. Um, you know, you could contact that company to see if they could add that functionality. All right, so we see uh, Mark Rabin just being thankful that we have these.
Okay, so I'm not sure if this question is to me, but from Brian L, do you use the latest version on Cubase? Uh, this may be, I see in our discussion with Jazz, dude, but uh, so yeah, I'm running 11.03 with uh, on Cubase, so. Okay, so I see from uh, Jay, so when discussing with a couple of friends, a competitor, DAW, they were discussing how they could use their online collaboration tools, but as I own Nuendo and don't have VST Connect, uh, when I look at what is offered instead of, in, instead of in the Nuendo compare chart, it shows network collaboration features, but what are the collaboration features in place of VST Connect? Uh, so you do have VST Connect SE with that, but in Nuendo, so let's go ahead and open up uh, Nuendo 11, but there is kind of a network collaboration. So let's say, you know, we have a lot of facilities where maybe there's a, a main mix stage and maybe a couple of satellite editing rooms and they could all be working on the same project. So inside of Nuendo, if you had a facility, this is really kind of what it's designed for. And I'll just jump back to this project. Okay, so when we come here, you'll have a network tab in Nuendo. So as you can see, once you have Nuendo, that you do have the VST Connect SE. But now when we come right over here, we could have a network tab so we could activate this. And let's say three people are working on uh, the same project, but maybe they're in different facilities. It used to be that people would run around in the old days with different hard disks, like firewire drives, and it would copy over the edits. But now what you can do is just say, you know, you could have one person that's kind of the administrator, if you will, of the particular project. And then other people can be working on, let's say one person is focusing on dialogue, one person is focusing on sound design and effects. Another person is doing music editing. The person that's the main administrator could say, you know, these tracks are assigned to this particular user. Uh, so when we come here to the network, you could set up kind of the project sharing and permissions so that you could say, you know, this person is doing, and these are all assigned directly to this user and they're doing this. So the master administrator, they could be mixing and then say, okay, I just finished mixing this queue. And now what I want to do is to actually download and I could, you know, download all of the edits directly that the voice over that the you know, dialogue editor has been working on. And those edits would automatically, you know, just come directly into the master project. So we could have kind of a network collaboration uh, on a local area or wide area network. So that's some of the other features that you see in Nuendo and that's not found in Cubase where multiple people could be working on different uh, tracks in a project collaboratively. So that's what that means, Jay. All right. All right, so I just see, um, it says, uh, just a comment. This is, I think, directed to Mark Rabin. Uh, a lot of my problems come because my girlfriend wants reverb on a voice while recording, and I understand that, but I am not skilled in Cubase, so probably just making uh, lots of mistakes while learning. You know, one of the cool things that you, if you have, like, these, you know, Steinberg UR series that has a built-in of audio interfaces, they have built-in DSP for reverb but if you want it to have reverb you know every time that you put a reverb on a voice that could potentially add latency to it you know and you so you know just be aware that you know some reverb plugins will have more latency such as 
a convolution reverb will have probably a higher latency than a simpler reverb. So many reverbs you can kind of get away with it, but if you're if your girlfriend is like really particular with you know uh, audio with the latency, you know, because that could throw off performances, you know, pretty easily. We could come over here, and I'll just set my outputs here. So when I go to add an audio track with a UR interface, it's the cool thing about this is I could say, okay, um, I want to just, you know, add a particular track. So let me just go to my input tab here. So let's say, okay, I want to set this to input one. that you, know, you could actually set up the onboard DSP uh, directly from, uh, you know, from the inspector here for that. So, but you know, be aware that anytime you're adding plugins, you have the potential of adding latency. All right, so we see uh, does Steinberg plan on bringing Dolby Atmos mixing over to Cubase in the future? So right now it's kind of limited to being in the Nuendo product family, uh, but you know they I don't know what's going to be in the future products, um, and often you know they're not going to announce kind of big directions or changes like that until a new product is released. And it's not that we're trying to. Uh, you know, hide stuff from users. But, you know, if we announce stuff like that for competitors, you know, there's, uh, so you know, we usually don't announce stuff in advance until the product is released, you know, because we don't want to necessarily, you know, it is a competitive marketplace. So we don't want to necessarily, you know, give our hand to everyone months in advance. All right, so we see that Michael Teams had a great retirement party over the weekend from the post office. Congratulations. All right, so we see, uh, is there a way for musical mode on audio tracks to be engaged by default to the native BPM in the session without having to enable it track by track? So if you wanted to turn musical mode in on for all tracks, you know, you could, you know, there's, there's two ways of doing it. One is to just, you know, select all audio tracks. So if I come here and just do, you know, if I do a select all, and if I change one of these, that that would change for all of them. So you see like this little icon here indicating musical modes, if they're all selected. One other way to do this is if you go into the pool window, you could see all of the audio files here in the pool. You could select, hold down the shift key, and let me get my keyboard on the right computer now. All right, so when I come here, um, and then you could turn on and off musical mode kind of for multiple events like that in the pool as well. All right, reading through more comments. Thanks for all the great questions.
All right, so Mark Rabin sends 79 watching, only 50, 55 likes. Crush that thumbs up. And so. All right, so we just see uh, how to find the kick pith. I assume this is pitch. Um, so one way to do it is just to kind of come over here. So let's say we have the kick drum. Uh, and then if I just wanted to go to very audio, you click here, it'll do an analysis of it. And this will probably give us a kind of a good idea what the fundamental pitch is. So it's probably right around in this case F you could also, if we have, um, you know, if you want to take just one particular sample, I could just take this particular, let's say I'll just grab my range selection tool and I want it to, let's cut that particular range and I'm just going to turn this into its own audio file. So of one sample. So I will just say bounce selection and now you could just select that file and if you go to statistics under audio menu this will give you kind of the pitch there as well so that's two different ways to be able to determine pitch of kick All right, uh, so you just see, can we get instant preview of VST preset? Um, so let's just come over here. So let's say if I'm going to my VST instruments and I want to go to retro log, you know, so depending on the instruments, if I'm here, um, you know, so what sometimes, you know, if you're loading up big samples, it may take and as I go down to the next patch. So, you know, depending on how on the instrument, you may have to, you know, you may just reset different things. But I think it's not bad for your auditioning sounds. So, all right, great to see Mandy Lane, who's able to join us for the live stream. All right, um, so I see before the summer sale's over, I'm going to buy either Backbone or Transverse. Uh, can't decide any opinion which will give me the most bang for my buck. So, you know, it could really depend. I would say if you're going to be doing, you know, if you do a lot of, like, you know, drum resynthesis, probably Backbone is pretty amazing tool. Um, but, you know, check out also, you know, depending if, you know, if you don't have Absolute 5, that's included as well. So I'm not sure if the Absolute 5 is on the uh summer sale um but if that's available you know like consider maybe getting it with an absolute five because that gives you so many different options as well but get both so Oh, so yeah, I see uh, Jeff Sabelski reminded me of um, one of the included synths is a wavetable synth, so Flex. Um, so I think this was uh, from Redna L, if, if I remember correctly. But uh, so Flex, if you wanted to do that as well. So and I think we could do this within Halion Sonic SE. Or 
flux rather. So if I just wanted to come here, thanks for the reminder on that. So, so you do have one that comes with it so you don't have to go out and buy Halion 6. Thanks for the reminder, Jeff. All right, so you see a question. Hi, what's the difference between Halion 6, Halion SE, and Halion Sonic? All right, so there's Halion Sonic SE, Halion Sonic, and Halion 6. So um, what I would do is just, you know, think of Halion Sonic SE is what come, they're all based on, from the same engine. Uh, and then there's different features. So Halion Sonic SE comes with Cubase, and that comes with your def a lot of different default sounds. Uh, so if you wanted to treat it like a rompler or a wavetable synth or a virtual analog synth, this will play back, you know, just about all of the Halion libraries and comes with every copy of Cubase. If you wanted to add more capabilities such as the flex phraser for doing like, you know, guitar arpeggios and and more sounds that you could purchase Howley and Sonic. So we could think of Howley and Sonic SE and think of the SE as starter edition. So that's kind of the light version. We have Howley and Sonic whose intention is to be like to play back all the sounds. So if you want just the capability of having a wide variety of sounds and you want to be able to tweak and edit the changes. Halion Sonic is a perfect kind of playback engine and instrument for that. If you want it to go to the next level and let's say create instruments from scratch or do your own sampling and create your own sounds and sound design, that's what Halion is going to be more designed for. So, you know, Halion Sonic SE that comes with Cubase will, you know, load up Halion patches and sounds, uh, you know, and will be kind of its playback engine. Halion Sonic will add more capabilities, more depth of editing. And if you wanted to sample and make your own sounds, that's who probably the Halion customers for. All right, so we see that the locator's uh, answer for Millard Brown was perfect. So always nice when it's an easy solution like that. All right, so I get tuxedo ice cream from Mr. Teens today. So thank you. That's very generous. It'll be good for my throat. All right, so we see if routing audio, let's say vocal into different channels to apply separate parallel effects differently in separate channels when sun back to the mix group will uh, route its signal, divide or double. So it's gonna double. So it's basically gonna blend between the two sources. So let's say, and we'll do this for a vocal. So let me just find a file I was thinking of. Okay, so we know everyone loves this song from Vince Melamed. Okay, so let's say if I want to take, you know, the vocal here of this. So now at this point, uh, I'm going to add two group channels. Okay, and I'm going to send this to groups three and four. Okay. 
Okay, so now. You wouldn't mind. So now we do this. And we had another question and emailed in about this. So. So now if I really want to do this in parallel. Our musical history laid out on the floor. I've got to choose what's mine and what's yours. So you know the the concept with parallel is that we're taking you know this this sound and blending it with this one. So one that's going to be probably you know very natural in dynamics, and one that's going to be really squashed in dynamics, and then you know being able to you know just take those two now you're asking beatles or stones something about that just sounds so wrong what is to it away you just start a fight take the rest so that's kind of the intention so it's not halved but you know it's blending those two signals so All right, so we have Mike checking in from the Big Apple. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so we see, um, uh, hi, I'm new to this. I'm loving the stream. I come from version five. I'm here to learn about all the other things Cubase can do. I would love to see a stream focused on the hardware setup. So, you know, it's really any question you have on particular hardware setups. We'd be happy to kind of answer. So if you have anything in particular you want to see, uh, we'd be happy to go over that for you. Okay, so we see, hey Greg, uh, in Cubase for the Mac, can you drag and drop stems from the spectral layers directly into the arranger track? So let's go ahead and take a look. All right, so let me just make sure I'm understanding this real quick. Uh, okay, so let's say we have our stems here. So I will come to, let's say my spectral layers. And I will unmix stems. So let's say I want vocals, piano, bass, drums. and we can watch its progress up here. Okay, so now that we have this, um, so I could say now I just, I could see the layers here and then I'm just gonna drag that onto the project window and it automatically places that. And we can see this gets changed to Unmix Vox. And as we just kind of play, we could have everything except for the vocals here. Can I tell you that it's too late? And we just drag that right into but the project window. So once you see kind of the layers here, uh, you could just drag those layers uh, directly back into the project window, just like that. It's a pretty cool feature.
Okay, so we have a question. Um, I see, hi, I need some help, please. How to color many tracks with one click, please? I'm using Windows, I'm new to Cubase, so any tips would be great. Okay, so let's say if I wanted to take all of these tracks and make them all the same color, I could select all of the tracks here. We'll go to our color tool, and then I could just select the color and multiple tracks will be colored accordingly. So once again, select all the tracks. Make sure that you don't have an event selected, but you know, just come right over here. Select all of the tracks only, no events, and select the color tool, and then you can just color multiple tracks that easily. All right, so we see from Cubase Chunky says, I never thought about doing the slice rules. It's dope. It's pretty cool. All right, we have more than Conqueror checking in from Netherlands. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we see, uh, I think this is with the drum editing. Why does the crossfade button only show up after hitting the slice and then having to leave the dialog to click in a Cubase window and then crossfade appears a button in the quantized dialog? All right, so I don't think that's how, I don't think, let's, we'll take a quick look at it, but. Just revert this. So I don't think you have to leave the window, but it could be that there's, you know, after it's been sliced and then quantized, you know, there's nothing that really needs to be quantized to be crossfaded, but it's as the positions are kind of uh, slipped, you know, and shifted. So let's come over here. So I'll find kind of my hit points. Okay, so. so now when I come over here to the quantize, um, so we slice. All right, and then we quantize. So as we've now quantized this, we could see if we kind of zoom in. That will have these gaps, and then that's when we crossfade the gaps. So, you know, because as we kind of go through this process, until we quantize, you know, there's no gaps. So we need to close those gaps and that's when you do the crossfade to close those gaps. So we see Jeff Sabelski just mentioning he likes using folder tracks more and more. So it's a great organization tool. Okay, we have a question. Uh, what is the best way to transfer a mix I have done from one song to a different song so I can uh, just do some little adjustments to get things to fit in the other song but still have the general sound? So, you know, if you wanted to, you could just come over here and do 
uh, I would do import tracks from project. So let's say, okay, I'm here and I wanted to take, you know, uh, let's, I'll just do some mixed changes here in our console. So, you know, I wanted to come here, let's say, and I like kind of the basic levels and plugins I got on the other session. So now what I'm going to do is just go to file and we'll say import tracks from project. And this may seem like you don't, you're like, why do, I don't want to insert the tracks. I just want to take the projects. But what we're going to do is we're going to take the tracks from the project and we're going to come over here. We can say, we could say, okay, we want to select all select matching, but I don't want the events and parts. I just want the channel and inspector settings and you could choose to include or exclude the automation. And now I will come right over here and it'll match those. And now the change will automatically solve that the mixer had changed over to carry over all those settings to EQs. Everything will just be applied directly to the new project. Okay, so we see, uh, can you transpose the chord pads? Let's give it a shot. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. So I'm, see, I'm about, lots of questions today. So I'm about at, um, I'm about almost an hour behind the uh, live questions. I apologize, I'm trying to catch up. Okay, so let's say we have um, my chord pads here. And to see if we could transpose them. So if we click on the uh, functions menu, we'll see transpose all pads. And I could just say, let's go down minus one. So we see that we're in C major So now. So just click right here, transpose all pads again. So let's say we'll go up three, so I should put this in D. So once again, just click right here and just select transpose all pads. All right, so we have a question. Uh, hello, Cubase Nation. Greg, I know spectral, later, spectral Layers already comes with Cubase 11, but I want the pro version. So on the Steinberg site, there is no option to upgrade from the version that comes in Cubase. So yeah, with, you know, sometimes if, um, you know, so the version that comes with Cubase is Spectral Layers 1. And, you know, since that's included and you didn't purchase Spectral Layers like Elements, that at that point, since, you know, you didn't necessarily, you know, spend money on doing, on getting into the spectral layers family, that that's why, you know, they kind of have it included to encourage people to upgrade from there. And I realize that they're, you know, so if you had spectral layers elements and then want to go to, to upgrade it to more capabilities with spectral layers pro, you could do it that way but there, I don't believe that there is an upgrade from, uh, you know, Spectral Layers 1 since it's only an OEM product, you know, that only comes with and that you can't purchase it, that there isn't uh, a upgrade option from that version. So, and it's usually pretty typical for a lot of software stuff.
reading through comments. All right, so we see from uh, Keith Young. Uh, so Greg, uh, running Cubase 11, Groove Agent 5, please run through using three or four kits and dragging a pattern into the project. For some reason, not all the kits I drag across play is one. Uh, what am I doing wrong? Okay, so let's go ahead and try. Okay, I'll just load up a different Groove Agent SE kit here. see these okay so when I come over here so let's say I'll I have a uh, couple three groove agent kits here so I'm going to take this and so let's say I'll play this particular pattern so sometimes what can help uh, is just to turn uh, on kind of the dedicated, just click on this little icon here. It's very subdued. Um, and then drag that over. So I'll go ahead and, and just play this and we'll see if it translates. All right, so that seemed to work fine. But once again, just, and we'll try one from a, a beat agent kit. So we'll open up this, let's go to its patterns. So again, just turn this on because sometimes you'll have notes that may be shared with kits and the instrument sounds. So this will make the patterns kind of, uh, you know, completely dedicated. So let's say if I drag this over, so we'll listen to it here. And I will just listen to it here. And we'll do our last one, Haywire. So. And let's listen to that. So if you have a particular kit that's that's misbehaving, just click right there on that icon and that will give us a dedicated MIDI port to that. And then that should take care of it for you, Keith. Okay, so just see uh, from Pearl Austin. Hello, Greg. Is there an opportunity to do a live mix from you to imitate in parallel? Uh, special how you mix a song with Cubase plugins. Um, so I'm not sure, Pearl, if you want me to just show you how to do parallel processing or or if you wanted like overall like for mixing a song. So you know, let's say if I wanted to do like a parallel thing on drums, which is pretty typical. So we'll come back. I'll just use a slightly different project here. My go-to project, but let's try this one. So let's say if I want to do for drums here. Mm -hmm. 
So I want to take all my drums. All right, so I'm going to just... So if I want to do like parallel on drums, if this is kind of what the question's about, I'll come over here. I'm just going to add, you know, group channels. So I'll just add these kind of independent. So we'll create them outside of the folder. Let's add two. So now I'm going to have my, uh, so it looks like I already have a drum group here. So let's say now I have everything going into my drum group. But what I could do is I'm just going to come over here to my send. And then I want to, let's say I'll just send everything and I'll enable quick link. So I'll just select all of my drum tracks here and go to send, send it all to group two, turn it on. I'll set it to absolute and we'll come. And send it, we'll send it all to group three. Okay, so let's say now when I do this, now my drums are will be going to. So if I have these two different drum tracks, I, I'm just gonna take this and for Now, that's like, let's say this is my drum group here, and this is the parallel. And just kind of blend that in. So you wanna hear that kind of in context? So let's say where our drums were, and now we blend a parallel group in to give a little more punch. So that's a real quick idea of how you can kind of set it up. Um, but let me know if I'm misunderstanding your question, Pearl. Um, so we see, does Cubase have Vietnamese and Chinese instruments? Um, so it's going to have, you know, nothing particular, but we'll probably have an ethnic group inside of Halion Sonic SE. So let's go ahead and just take a look. So not as many kind of, you know, probably pretty cliche MIDI sounds here. So, but if I wanted to, you know, and we do kind of share some of this sound, sound, uh, some sound sets with Yamaha but nothing like totally specific for uh, like a dedicated Vietnamese or Chinese instrument. And, but you could also design your own sounds as well. All right, so we have Michael Marshall checking in from Somerset, UK. Glad you could join us. See Jazz Dude saying, you know, watch the Junkie XL videos on YouTube. So yeah, Tom's a wonderful resource to have available on YouTube to watch. Q 
Okay, it's just my chat field reset on me. Uh, so I see why Cubase Pro 10.5 doesn't work with Bluetooth headphones like Apple AirPod. So I think you could run it, but you um, you may have to just simply set your studio setup here. And then, you know, depending on, I'm not sure if you're in Mac or PC, but if you choose like on PC, you should see it as an audio output here, I believe. Um Realize that working with Bluetooth headphones can be annoying because there is a lot of latency in the Bluetooth specification. So, but I think you could just set it up directly here. Um, and on Windows, you may just have to set it up to generic low latency driver and then choose the Bluetooth headphone output. But I think, you know, I've read people online doing it, but again, there's a lot of latency issues with the Bluetooth headphones just by the nature of Bluetooth. So. Okay, uh, can you please talk about how to hook up a hardware synthesizer if they have multiple tracks, how to route them so I can get MIDI and audio separate for each track? So, you know, generally, if you, you know, depending on your hardware synths, you know, some people will record one single track at a time if you have a two in, two out interface. You know, for my setup, you know, because I, I think I still have like 23 or 22 hardware synths in my rack and in my studio, I have them all going into a mixer and I have a, a bus that's sent out to a mixer to two inputs. Um, you know, I could take the analog outputs from the instrument from the instruments and just connect them to input on my audio interface if you have like an audio interface with you know eight inputs or 16 inputs to do it like that but it's really just kind of you know just doing straight audio connections uh between the hardware instruments and going into the audio interface you could also in cubase if you have the you know enough inputs on the system uh, you could just come over here to your audio connections and go to external instruments and say I have my Yamaha montage it's connected into this input uh, and then you could just open that up as a um, you know directly as a VST instrument so you say I want to add a track an instrument track but you know if you wanted to capture you know eight, instruments or four instruments you know it's probably you would need to have the appropriate number of inputs on your audio interface and that would dictate how many you can record simultaneously so if you wanted them to be separate so and that's a big reason why a lot of people just migrated to working with virtual instruments because they're so much more convenient for this because eventually you're probably gonna have to take it into audio at some point All right, so we just see, uh, I have WaveLab Pro 10. I think I heard uh, WaveLab 11 is out now. So yeah, WaveLab 11 was released last Wednesday. So, and there will be a live stream on it tomorrow. So if you guys wanna see what's new, I think uh, Justin Perkins is doing the WaveLab 11 live stream. So check that out. So it has a lot of great new features, especially with, um, you know, working with multi-channel interlude files, which is something that a lot of people would want it. So a lot of great workflow enhancements. All right, we see a nice comment from Tim Weinheimer. It says, uh, thanks to Greg for making Cubase uh, great by helping us use it to its fullest potential. It's great. That's why we do these live streams. And thanks for being a great member of the community, Tim. All right, and we have David M. joining from Liverpool. Thanks for joining. All right, so I just see, uh, can I email with specific issues? Um, so, um, 
yeah, so you could send uh, any any topics to be covered uh, just by going to clubcubase at steinberg.de. All right, so we see the from Michael Pierce, uh, the CC-121 was discontinued, eek. Yeah, there's still some available. It's just, you know, going further, there may not be production runs after they run out of the hardware supply. It's kind of a big issue for a lot of companies making, you know, music equipment and hardware now. Okay, so to see uh, Cubase or FL, which one is best? So I think that Cubase will give you significantly more options. So, and it's you'll find that Cubase is definitely going to be kind of the industry leader for features. Um, so, and you could do, you know, one thing that I find really great about Cubase is that the fact that, A, you know, we support our customers by doing these types of live streams and that we're also... Um, you know, if you're doing multiple types of music, some programs will really kind of pigeonhole you into a particular workflow. So, you, you know, it's only really good for EDM or it's only really good for audio, whereas Cubase can be, you know, great for just about any use. All right, uh, so I just see, um, thanks, I'll email, but can anyone elaborate why Yamaha doesn't support their studio manager in Cubase 11 Pro? So I wasn't aware of any changes that happened in Cubase 11 Pro. I haven't used a studio manager, but if you want to email me, I'd be happy to kind of download it. I think I had to download it on Cubase 10 or 10.5 to check for someone. Okay, so we see uh, any chance you could show us how to do pitch bend automation in Cubase when using the synths uh, Yuhi Diva and Zebra. So I don't have those instruments, but um, we can show you how to, you know, if you want to do pitch bend as a MIDI controller, you know, as a, as, or not a controller, but maybe as a MIDI system common message. Um, So let me just, okay. So if I wanted to just see pitch bend here, um, we could see it in our controller lane. So if you wanted to, you know, and we could do, okay, I want to show the semitone grid and we could say my pitch bend for the instrument is set to two up, two down. We could match that. We could have this automatically snap. So we say, okay, I want to do a pitch bend uh, directly here. And let me just say, okay, I want it to ramp down to one below. So at this point, you could just ramp uh, and have it snap to being in tune. If So you could do it as MIDI system common message in a key editor. Or if you wanted to do this as an automation parameter, I think if we just come over here and go to more and just type in pitch. And you may have to go to like the instrument here. And then you could just say pitch bend. And then you could, you know, for that particular MIDI channel, you could draw in uh, it as automation data. And that would work the same way for any VST instrument.
Okay, so just see uh, about the pitch bend, it says they don't have wheels on the VST, so I don't know how to record it and then edit the pitch bend data. So yeah, so you know, once you, if you don't have, you know, so generally a lot of times, you know, the wheels that you see in instruments, they don't necessarily transmit uh, like MIDI pitch bend, but they will, you know, react to MIDI pitch bend data, but generally it's gonna be recorded directly into uh you know from a midi controller but if you don't just you know go to pitch bend right here and you could draw it in like we just showed okay so you just see how to control incoming volume uh when we use talkback so you know there are a couple of preferences here so say you know when we do talk back there is a talk back dim level here so you may have to click on the main and then just kind of um, click right here on the word main and then you could have a talk back dim level right there so it's pretty easy to kind of miss clicking there to get extended parameters below but try that and then you can see the talk dim directly there. All right, so we see uh, so um, any update on M1 compatibility for Cubase Pro 11? So, um, you know, they're continuing to work on it. So they did get it. So it's Rosetta compatible. So, you know, many DAWs are not fully uh, M1 compatible. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, different third-party components that people rely on that probably won't be working on M1 chips. So there's... Uh, a lot, um, you know, there, it's a pretty big task, but I know that the development team is working on it, so. All right, so I just see, uh, Greg, any update on the SoundCloud on export? Um, so I'll I'll just kind of check. I have a meeting tomorrow with uh, the Cubase project manager, so I'll check in with him on that. So if you want to ask me on Friday. Okay, so I'm just reading a comment from Jeff Sabelsky. I'm not sure if it's an answer to someone or to me. So it says, uh, record your pitches for a new scale using Halion 6 in record mode and activating auto next, but you'll still only have 12 pitches, keys in a scale for your new scale. So... So I'm not sure, Jeff, if you let me know if that's a question for me I mean, it just might be with uh with taylor's question about you know translating indian music but you know so generally you know to trigger it from midi you know it's going to be within the midi scale but you could you know do your tuning within the instrument itself Okay, so we have a question. Uh, do we ever see the day we can log into Cubase and access it from a cloud and not be restricted to our laptop computer limitations where you pay for your level of access and power, i.e. RAM? So if you're kind of anticip if you're kind of asking if it could be like you could run it from a network, like a master network, you know, that kind of works okay, f I think, for word processing. Like if you want it to be something like, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft Office 365 or, 
you know, Gmail, like web-based applications, you know. So the trick is, you know, that those things don't rely on synchronization down to, you know, one 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 hundred one one hundred ninety two thousandth potentially of a second to be in sync. So, you know, ideally it would be cool to do that, but, you know, the practicality of doing real time in monitoring and accessing effects while you're trying to input, you know, you don't notice latency on typing, uh, but as you're kind of working in a doll like environment, I would say that we're still ways off from that. I'm not saying that someone isn't working on something like that in the future. So, okay. So I just see uh, from Pearl Austin, big lag here. Did you answer my question, Greg? Um, so I think we may have answered your question earlier. So, but. Um, but yeah, there will be a lag because it's hard to keep up with live questions as we explained at the beginning. Uh, which, which is the best free plugin for drums in Cubase? So probably, you know, I would say that the best is going to be, you know, I would go straight for a uh, groove agent and this will work as either kind of a you know, virtual drummer, or if you wanted it to be kind of like an, uh, more of an MPC drum machine style, uh, instrument as well. And that comes included with Cubase. So Groove Agent SE5. All right. We have Peter checking in from Montreal. All right, so we see uh, from David M, uh, one of my wing controllers keeps random notes held on through any VST instrument. I've tried deleting MIDI CCs in the drop down menu and turn using transformer with no effect. Uh, any ideas? Okay, so what I would do, you know, while you're playing it, you know, while you just kind of see, but if you, uh, so let's say if you've recorded stuff, you know, you know, like while you just are holding the instrument and while you just play like a very simple phrase and go to the MIDI monitor. Uh, so once we have the MIDI monitor, this will show all MIDI activity. So if it's like, you know, a MIDI CC, that's just kind of randomly causing things to, you know, notes to be stuck, or if you're not seeing, you know, so as I would play in something from my MIDI controller, I would see all these, you know, parameters just show up here. And you could, you know, and if you say, oh, it's spitting out, you know, tons of this MIDI CC unexpectedly, you could do that. Another way of kind of doing this, if you want to take an existing recording, so let's say if I just, <clears throat> you know, recorded something, and let's say if I just had a bunch of, so let's say if I come here and I had aftertouch, let me just make this longer. Okay, so let's say I had a bunch of CC data, um, So now if I wanted to take like an existing track where I have a recording, I would go to the MIDI and go to the list editor. And then you could probably, this will show you all of the different MIDI messages. So my guess is that it's probably spitting out some, ex, some other controller unexpectedly. And you know, you may not be able to find it initially, but if you look at it with the MIDI list editor, 
or with the MIDI monitor that you should uh, you should be able to see that you should be able to see what message is being kind of transmitted from the wind controller. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, my Yamaha ONV96i uh, studio manager has constant MIDI and audio activity spikes. All MIDI inputs clashes with other, making a continuous hum uh, till I switch to my MIDI keyboard. How to fix this? Um, so I haven't worked. With, I haven't worked with the ONV96 in uh, 15 years or so. Um, but what I would check is, I think that there's going to be three, if memory serves, there's going to be three different MIDI ports for the ONV96, and maybe one is for Studio Manager, one might be for transmitting MIDI, uh, like a traditional MIDI port, and one may be uh, for the remote control layer mode. So make sure that you know when you go to the studio, to the studio setup, one thing that you might want to try is just to make sure that your O1V96 MIDI drivers, maybe they're not set to in all MIDI inputs. So maybe just uncheck from all MIDI inputs and, you know, and generally that may, you know, and make sure that if you have it set up for the studio manager, that you, if you have it set up, you know, that those are going, you know, to the, you know, when you go to like your studio manager and you set up, you define like for your control surface. So let's say if I have an O1V96 here, that we have this MIDI ports, these MIDI ports, uh, you know, defined correctly. Okay, so to see uh, Steinberg, we need multi-track warping. So yeah, they're aware of that. So, uh, but we'll pass it along again. So, but it's a common feature request and the developers and product planning, they understand that. All right. Um, okay, so we see from John Costigan, great to see you on the live stream. Thanks for joining. Uh, I realized at about 2 a.m. the song I was completely that the song I have completely completely rendered is too slow. I just learned uh, from you how to select a whole pool into musical mode. Can this save the day? So yeah, just simply you know save. Let's say if we're here, um, let me just revert. You know, so with all of your audio files, let's say I will go to my pool window, just control or command P, place all the files, select all the files here, and we'll put it into musical mode. So let's say we were originally recorded at 100 beats a minute, and now if it's, you want it to be 104, and that's all you have to do. So once you do that, then all of your audio will just kind of, and your MIDI will play back at the new tempo. So that should save the day for you. Okay, so we see uh, from uh, Jay. So, uh, so with uh, the network, so with network collaboration tools, uh, must all network clients be on the Steinberg DAW? Um, so, yeah. So, you know, with the Nuendo networking collaboration, um, they will all need to be on Nuendo for that because it's you know sharing the same Nuendo project. Um, so I see, could Steinberg please produce a setup tutorial walkthrough? So there may be an old one, but I'll put it on a list. I have some tutorials I'm gonna be starting, so I'll see if I could add that to my list.
All right, so we have Bob checking in from Macon, Georgia. Thanks for joining. All right, uh, so we have a question from Daniel. I wonder if there's a cool way to zoom in into a quiet waveform without using the editor window or enlarging the single track to see more details and still seeing the other tracks uh, on Cubase 11. So there is, you know, if you come up here, there's a special kind of amplitude zoom. So let's say if you had like very low level material, um, we could choose to just kind of come so it's kind of just right here. Um, so you could just zoom in. And I think if you just do <clears throat> Alt, let me get, see if I remember the keyboard shortcut. And there's a keyboard shortcut for this as well. But if you just kind of go right here, so if you consistently work with you know very low level amplitude you could now just kind of come right here and it doesn't affect the volume you, you know so sometimes i get this like oh i did something and you know all my you know it doesn't sound like it's distorting but all of the tracks are distorting so i, I thought yeah so it's just uh, alt or option plus g and h you could just kind of zoom the amplitude of the waveform. And that doesn't change the volume, but just so if you needed to work with very kind of low level amplitude material, you could see it better and it makes it a little easier editing. Uh, so question, if I like the ambient visions uh, VST preset for Flux, is there any way to add that to favorites to make it easy to find? So generally, so let's go and come over here. Um, one way you could do it is, let's say, I'll come here to VST Instruments. All right, so let's say I'll get to Halion Sonic SE. Get a flux. All right. So let's say if I like so let's say if I wanted to come here, I think if we go to that we could find the ratings. We just All right, let me see because one thing that I often do, I'll show you in the large media bay and I think you could do it in the other one. So let's say if you come to, all right, so let's say factory presets, we wanna to go to VST3 presets. But if you have a particular preset, so let's say if I just wanted to come, oh, sorry, this may be under VST sound. All right, so let's say if I'm here and I have flux, 
but try just you could you know just come over here and give it like five stars and then you could say i only want to look for five star presets so you could kind of do ratings uh and then for your favorite one then when you go to your media bay just have it search for five star presets and you could do that over here as well so let me just But I think if you just kind of choose, there's in one of these where you could just find like the ratings. So, okay, so we go to rating here. So then you could say, okay, I just want to find five star. And then at that point, you could find all of your favorite sounds very easily. So give that a try, Millard. So Okay, so we see uh, from Millard Brown's uh, regarding the Halion versions, is Sonic and or Sonic SE lighter on memory or CPU than the Halion 6, or is it just the same uh, image with stuff disabled? I believe it's going to be the same performance with stuff just being disabled. Uh, but I think if you have like a really beefy sample uh, in, you know, Halion Sonic SE, Halion Sonic or Halion, that it will basically take the same amount of CPU and memory. All right, so I just see, uh, hi Greg, in Halion, is there a way to sample the main stereo out? Previously, I created a group and set the group as an input in Halion, but recording from the main out would be really useful. So currently you have to do it through a group or through uh, an output, um, but you know, so that that's how it is kind of set up for the routing currently to do that, so. Uh, so we see, is this Cakewalk by BandLab? No, this is Cubase by Steinberg. Okay, so we see, uh, Greg, for the flex arpeggio style, can we choose, uh, we can choose uh, piano or guitar in standard, I think. Can we customize the guitar strings as if playing a five string guitar tuned to an open tuning? without the low strings. I think it's going to basically, you know, be the default guitar uh, arpeggiator. So I don't think it could be customized. Uh, so when we come over here, so when we go to the arpeggiator, so I don't think that that is going to provide for any, uh, you know, you know, typical like alternate guitar tunings when in guitar mode, unfortunately, so. All right, so we have Steve Leeds checking in from the San Francisco Bay Area. Thanks for joining us. All right, so I see, uh, I'm not sure if this is covered for, uh, so I see Greg uh, using Cubase 11, Groove Agent 5, dragging three kits to project. 
uh, from pattern only gives me one kit. What am I doing wrong? So let's go take a look. Okay, so let's come over to just revert this quickly. Okay, so I think if we grab three different patterns. Okay, so I'm gonna start that pattern over. So let's say select this pattern, drag it. Okay, so now I'll just listen to this. Let's see if it changes patterns here. The next pattern we should hear the bell. So that seems to be working. Uh, um, so dragging three kits to project from pattern only gives me one kit. So, you know, if you are, you know, and it could be if we have this in, um, let me just see if it's in Groove Agent 5, you know, like where we have, so let's say if we're in, uh, let's say if it was Groove Agent 5 and not the SE version where we could have multi kits. So let's say I have Groove Agent 1 here, so let's just randomly load up. Let's say a pattern here. So if it is in uh, the full uh, groove agent, let's say, okay, I have like a beat agent, a percussion agent here. You know, we can think of this as going to be MIDI channel one, MIDI channel two, and MIDI channel three. So if I wanted to drag, you know, this pattern over, you know, that's only going to play back that pattern. But if I wanted to drag uh, this kit here, so now when I play this back, since this is all going to MIDI channel one, it's gonna play back the pattern that's for this, but on the wrong sound. So if you wanted to do this, you would probably have to add like two MIDI tracks. These would automatically be assigned and now I could drag over this that particular groove agent pad here. And if I wanted to take this, and since these will be going to, let's say groove agent MIDI channel one, let's say MIDI channel two, MIDI channel three, that as we play back, that we could just solo each of those. So if it's a groove agent where you have multi agents, these would each need to be on their own separate MIDI channels routed to the same groove agent. So MIDI channel one, two, three, and four. So sorry if I misunderstood earlier. All right, so we just see uh, from Nick, uh, can you ask Steinberg to address this? There's a problem in rendering dry signal and transferring settings over to rendered track. 
Uh, the send panning on tracks does not get transferred over. Okay, so let's say if I have just a quick drum loop here and I'm gonna add a send to this. Okay, so let me just add an effects channel to that. So now, okay, so, um, so when rendering a dry signal and transferring settings over to the render track to send, okay, so I'm gonna adjust my send panning. So now I will just Let's make sure I have that. Okay, so let me just All right, so not sure if um So it says when rendering dry signal and transferring settings over to render track, the send panning on tracks does not get transferred over. All right, so let me just try. I'll just add in our effects channel track and do something really obvious. to say flanger. All right, so we only have the flanger on the right speaker so let's say if I wanted to take this and let's do a render in place I'll get to my render settings and I want the complete signal path so there I'm only hearing the flanging on the right channel as I had it panned so uh, just to make sure. So there's a problem when rendering dry signal and transferring settings over to the render track to send panning on tracks does not get transferred over, needs to. So let me know, Nick, if I'm misunderstanding or if that was kind of doing what, what you, if I was kind of doing it correctly. And you could send me an email after to, to, at clubcubase at steinberg.de as well it's great to see fred robinson on the live stream so you missed the free gift but you can probably get ice cream from michael teams in his post-retirement ice cream phase all right All right, uh, so we see, hello, greetings from Switzerland. My question, is there a way to start and stop the Cubase project with my MIDI keyboard? I would like the project to start when I play a note and stop the project after. So if you wanted to do that, we could do it in a generic remote. So I'll just come here to generic remote and I'm gonna just click on learn and I will Sorry, just spilled some water. All right, so I will Click here and I see that I send this note on message and then I could go to transport uh, device and then we could just click on, um, you know, start, stop. So if I just wanted to come here, hit apply. And if I wanted to click on the next note, so while I have that learned, 
And then I could say transport, you know, say command device stop. So now I'll hit apply. And again, you could do this by going to your studio, to studio setup, adding a generic remote from the plus. And now as I hit that note, it plays. I hit this note, it stops. And that's all you have to do. All right, so I see from uh, Ronnie Light um, on Nuendo 1103, can't send default, can't send default broadcast wave file, saving the setting as broadcast wave changer back to wave when reopening. So, um, so I'm not sure if it's, you know, often it may not be labeled. So I'm, I'm not sure, Ronnie, if you're saying that it's not being saved as a broadcast wave file like a you know and you're seeing it as a wave file but often a broadcast wave file can look can just have a dot wave extension and then just have the metadata within it that makes it kind of the broadcast wave file so let me know if if that's what you mean by your question so All right, we have uh, Lena checking in from Germany. Thanks for joining. Uh, so I just see, uh, does Absolute 5 come with a 30-day preview? Says, uh, I'm not sure if there's a preview for that or not. I know some of the individual components will have previews, but I don't think the whole, uh, the whole package will come as a preview or as a trial version. but I could be mistaken. I don't always follow the trial versions. Okay, we have Captain Energy Musics made it. Thanks for joining. Um, all right, so I just see from Captain Energy Music, I just wanted to ask if you. Uh, to let someone know that all the developer Steinberg links are broken. Do you know if they've moved somewhere? So if you want to uh, send me like one of the links that's broken, I, I'd be happy to kind of pass it along to the team. Yeah, so you see Fred Robinson's asking if anyone remembers the old puncher plugin, so it's a good one. My ch my chat field jumped on me, so just try to find my spot. Thanks for all the great, wonderful questions. If you learned something uh, new, make sure that you make sure that you hit the like button. All right, so I think I'm back to where I was, roughly. Um, so we see a question, uh, 
Okay, uh, does amplitude of a sample determine how well Cubase detects hit points? Um, so, you know, generally it's going to, you know, you could adjust the sensitivity of hit points for the detection. So, but, you know, if you have an audio file that's, you know, let's say, uh, you know, this would be an easier file to determine hit points than something that looked like this. Um, but, you know, since you could just, you know, if you go into the sample editor, you could adjust the threshold for the hit points. So unless it's like really extreme uh, with, you know, like lack of amplitude and like the highest that you're going to get is, you know, like, you know, minus 22 dB or something like that on your scale, you know, but you... You know, it's unless it's a real extreme amount, it doesn't really matter because you could just adjust the threshold here to determine at what point it the hit points will be will be you know picked up. All right, so we have Marvel Jam checking in from Wisconsin. Thanks for joining. All right, so we have, uh, do you have some tips on very audio? So, you know, one question just kind of that I just helped someone with over the weekend who had mailed in a question. Um, you know, they were trying to figure out how to get all of the controls of very audio. So let's say if I'm in, uh, very audio here, you know, so just kind of learning like what, like what the extended toolbars do. So you have like the smart controls here, set this to show all smart controls. And at this point, you know, we get uh, a lot more options that you get just from here. So with the default smart controls, I can adjust kind of the, you know, the quantizing of, you know, the curve or quantizing the notes to the nearest pitch. But once we enable, just once we enable kind of all of the smart controls, At this point, we get a lot more different options. So I could choose to, you know, adjust the volume of a segment. I could adjust the format. We could also do, uh, if I wanted to, you know, pick kind of different uh, points that I wanted to start. Like if I wanted to not have the transitions between notes uh have changes with the pitch that i could just kind of straighten the pitch and not affect in that particular range uh so that's super handy also if you want to set you know if a note had drifted flat at the end i could set this little kind of center diamond and only tilt from that particular point or if you wanted to tilt using a uh, hold down alter option you can tilt the pitch kind of like that one other thing that a lot of people miss is the ability of having a MIDI reference. So if I say I want to see like the grand piano, uh, that I could see uh, the actual piano underneath and actually see the uh, see that what pitches are for a reference. So I say, oh, the piano is playing this pitch, and you could see uh, and line up harmonically what's going on. So those are a couple of tips, but if you have any specific questions, just let, let me know. Uh, so I just see from Jeff Zabelski, uh, Greg, I couldn't seem to find an MR816 CSX manual, search discontinued hardware from support. Uh, I have it printed in, in black and white, but would like the PDF again. I'll keep looking. So if you send me an email to club Cubase at Steinberg.de, I'll see if I could dig it up. Um, but I may have a, a copy somewhere.
Okay, so you see, uh, I have a question. I'm new to Cubase and I got the pro, but in my projects, I can't open the MP3 slash move files and a lot of other audio files. How do I fix it? You know, so if it's going to be, you know, video files, there's going to be, uh, you know, so an MP3 file is you would just import uh, audio file and MP3 would be one of the choices. And with a dot movie file, that's going to be a video file. So instead of, you know, like a dot move file, you would just choose to import a video file. So. Okay, so it says a uh, new Cubase user from Reason. I imported a sample into Cubase and there were sections of the audio that hit points couldn't detect in Cubase that were detected in Reason DAW. Uh, that's why I'm asking. So, you know, if you wanted to, you could, you know, as you're coming over to hit points. So let's say, okay, I just wanted to, you know, edit hit points. If you really needed to, you could just come over here. And I think if you just hold down, um, let me just with the pencil tool. Okay, let me just do it with a another audio file here just to show you. Okay, so let's say if you you know want to come here, I think if you just hold down, um, just trying to remember what the keyboard shortcut is, but I think if you just hold down Alt or Command, that you could just manually add the hit points in. So let's say if I I'll just come over here and edit the hit points. So let's see if I can get the. But there are ways to just kind of manually enter in the hit points. I'm just trying to remember what the... But, you know, you, you can manually add them in as well. So let's say... Yeah, so I think if you just, uh, with kind of the play tool and then just click down Alt, you could just manually enter in hit points as well as you need it. Okay, reading through some more. All right, so we have Graham Witcher checking in from London. Thanks for joining. Uh, so I just see a question. If they discontinued the CC121, might there be a successor in the pipeline? Eight faders would be nice. So yeah, I've been kind of asking for an eight fader complement to the CC121 since the CC121 is released. Sometimes Yamaha could be a little slow in coming up with new products, but hopefully it'll be working on something, but nothing that's been announced yet. So.
Okay, so we have a question. Is there an option to just click somewhere in a track for positioning the playhead, not in timeline? So I think if you just hold down uh, Alt and Shift, Alt or Option plus Shift, uh, anywhere in the timeline, that will just kind of move the playhead to wherever you click. So while you're playing, you can just say. Otherwise, so just hold down Alt or Option plus Shift and click, and then that will move the playhead uh, anywhere without having to do it here. So once again, Alt Option, click, and that will move the playhead even while it's playing. Reading through more comments. So thanks for all the great questions. See discussions of A and W root beer restaurants and Whataburgers. Uh, so we just see, is anyone using Cubase on an M1 setup yet? Yep, so we have lots of people that are already doing it. So it just runs under Rosetta mode, like uh, the vast majority of DAWs. All right, so we see from Filter Freak, uh, Greg, I like to just say every single time I listen to you in the background, you point something out that reminds me to check or figure out something I've been meaning to do for a long time. Thanks. Well, that's great. I'm glad it could be helpful. Okay, so I just see from uh, Walsey, I've had Cubase one year and still have no idea how to use it. I had to build an entirely new PC with high-end CPU and lots of RAM. So if you have, you know, particular questions or, you know, how to get started, you know, there's a lot of tutorials. But if you have particular questions, just let us know, like, where you're stuck and hopefully we can help you break through so you can get more use out of your Cubase. All right, let me see. I think it's Steve Cummings, maybe. Always great info to Club Cubase meetings. So thanks for joining. All right, so we have Jean Marie in the live stream. See JVI's made the live stream as well. He's checking out. All right, so we have a question. Uh, can you show us how to create and save a color set? So once, let's say if I go to my project menu and I go to my project color setup, we can come over here to presets. Uh, so let's say if I want it to come over here, so let's say I want to have 32, I want 128 colors. At this point, I could just come right here. I could, 
sorry, my son's school bus is landing now. Uh, but we could store that color set as default. Uh, we could reset the color set to default. or um, And now, so once you just come over there, just again, go to project to project color setup. And you just could, you know, click on the option or presets here. So you can get, you know, more available colors and tints. And if you want to do you know, basic colors or color tints. You could have different choices here and then just go to options and then you could save that right there as your default. Uh, so I just see, can you record multi-lane in MIDI as you can with the audio track? So if, if um, so, if you wanted to record uh, like multiple MIDI tracks into one audio track, um, so I'm not sure if you wanted to do just lanes. just just revert this So let's say. Okay, so if I go to my MIDI recording setup, I could just say, okay, let's go to cycled. And I think we could just do the stacked. So if I wanted to just record here, I'll just say, okay, let's do cycle recording. Yeah, I'll just play low note. And now if I just want to go to the lanes, I could just come right over here and each of those different takes can be uh, just done uh, and activated and edited freely as well. So if that's what you want, Daryl, you could kind of treat it the same way as like comping audio, but let me know if I misunderstood. We have someone from Israel checking in. Thanks for joining. Okay. Okay, please example, I'm doing a swing on quantized panel, but every sound that came that come after it is not is not in that swing. Can you please show where it is in auto quantize? Uh, I'm just using Cubase 11. Okay, so let's give this a quick shot. Okay, so let's say if I just will do
All right, so let's say I have this. So let's say if I go to my quantize panel, let's try just a quantize swing and let's apply. So let's say I'll just make my quantize swing, let's say 67%. So let's say I just will select everything here. All right, so you can see the swing just applied right there. Hang on one second, my son is knocking at the door. Yeah. All right, sorry about the interruption. My son just got back from school. All right, just green through some more questions. All right, so we see from... Uh, Lena said, oh wow, that really, that already helped. I didn't know there was an all smart controls. So yeah. Okay, so I just see, um, so when I edit audio pitch, et cetera, in very audio for my singer, it always sounds very electronically edited, even when I try to make the curve, et cetera, as smooth as possible. Uh, do you have a tip on that? So, you know, a lot of times when I do editing and maybe I'm, you know, more traditional, like a lot of times I do quantizing, on stuff that you know only sounds like it needs to be quantized um and i'll do pitch shifting only on notes that sound kind of like maybe they're you know out of tune a bit to me so i think if you do uh you know pitch correction on every single note that that is when people could get into uh more trouble with that um but i think if we wanted to just take a look at, at very audio. So, you know, realize that there's always going to be, you know, it's perfectly fine for some notes to be slightly out of tune. So you don't have to make everything perfect. Um, dealing with transitions, you know, so like we talked about previously here, so let's say, You know, transitions can be really critical. So let's say I come over here and we see all of, of our smart controls. You know, when we do, you know, transitions between these notes, you know, the transitions are really critical. So if you need to just kind of come here, you know, do just, you know, leave that transition because that's where things can start to sound very, uh, 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 uh you know and a bit mechanical, but you know, it's perfectly fine for some notes to be slightly out of tune. We all, you know, people love Led Zeppelin records and you know, they're really out of tune. 
Um, you know, so if you wanted to go through and, you know, technically Robert Plant's flat on a lot of stuff, but it's it works for him. So, you know, go through here and, you know, if you do if you do a big jump, also try adjusting in the lower left-hand corner, you could adjust the formants. And that, you know, if you find that it's just not working well for that particular voice, try adjusting the formants and that can make a big difference as well. Okay, you're still reading through stuff. Some comments here. I know we have a bunch of questions that were sent in. We're going to jump over to those in just a minute. You see that Cubase junkie is, is admitting to being a Cubase junkie, so... Um, so I see since I started using Cubase, I've more or less stopped uh, buying plugins except for guitar amp sims. Is there any chance Steinberg slash Yamaha will update VST amp rack? So it's, um, I don't know if there's, you know, more research going on it. You know, obviously now Line 6 is part of the Yamaha family of brands as well. So, you know, who knows, maybe we'll do something with them, but that's just speculation on my part. All right, so we have a lot of questions. Let me get to those that were mailed in. Sorry, it's later than I thought. All right. All right, so we had a question that was mailed in that I figured out an answer to. This was uh, not mailed in, but rather uh, it was asked last week about how to fill room tone uh, between uh, like you know how to fill like an audio event between a range so let's say if I have this particular track here um, and I have this event and I want it like and I guess the question was dealing with room tone to fill like a selected range with that particular file um, so there is a way of doing it in Cubase I was I just had my brain cramp but if you go to functions and just go to fill loop. And what this will do is if we have like maybe room tone or just noise that we want it to fill, uh, we go to, again, edit to functions and go to fill loop. And that will automatically fill that audio file all the way to the end of the loop and even kind of cut off at the end as necessary. So. Uh, check. So uh, once again, sorry for missing that on the last live stream. So I figured it out after when I was doing the index. All right, so uh, just see a question. This is from uh, Dirk in Belgium. Uh, I work with Cubase Pro 11, and I use three monitors. I have a problem with my plugins. Uh, I have uh, F, uh, I, let's say, a, a plugin open on my screen number one, and when I do something on my screens, uh, number two, the plugin always disappears, even when I set the plugin on always on top. Can you explain maybe what I'm doing wrong? 
So it could be that maybe when you go, and I'll, I'll experiment with this. I didn't get a chance to check it. I have a dual screen set up uh, for my personal studio, and I didn't get a chance to check this, but I always seem to remember it not being affected. But if you have maybe a window that's spanning across two different screens, like maybe a project window and the third screen is going to be set up for um you know for the mix console that maybe if you click to make another uh prod another window that's always on top it may you know go over top of the always on top you know because sometimes people will set you know 20 things on top and you know they're they're going to be you know sometimes depending on the the uh window that you're looking at it may cover other things that are on top when they're activated but uh, I'll try to check it out and uh, see if I can figure out anything more when I get my studio, my personal studio kind of configured in my office tomorrow. Okay, so we had a number of questions. This is from someone who's transitioning from Logic. Um, so take order switch. Can we make it so that the takes uh, folder is presented with the most recent take at the top instead of the bottom? So a lot of times when we're doing um, like some type of comping, so let's say if we recorded you know multiple passes, in essence, what it is is one audio file that's broken down. So I think it kind of makes sense. And I realize that some of this may be, different than other programs but you know this will be take one at the top you know take two take three take four take five so i think that kind of makes logical sense um, but there isn't a way to switch those around so it's going to be kind of fixed but it'll be you know one two three four five six seven for the different takes which i think makes sense but if I understand if you're coming from kind of a different workflow area that that you know could be different uh it may be something there may be some things you have to get kind of used to so uh we had another question is there a way to undo zoom for example if you zoom on a specific spot and make a change is there a shortcut to automatically takes you back to the previous zoom amount so if you just zoom in here and then just double click if you use the zoom tool just double click with the zoom tool so i say okay i want to see this okay now double click and you go back to the previous zoom state. Now, you could also set up a key command, and under the zoom menu, there is an undo, redo zoom, and you could assign key commands to those. But the quickest way is just, you know, come right over here. If you use the zoom tool, just double click, and you could go right back. And even if we did multiple stages of zooming in, I could just double click, double click. It's like a zoom edit history and we could go right back to where we were initially. Okay, so we had a, a question on auto fade with length. Is there a way to select a region and with a shortcut automatically add a fade in and fade out of a, spe of a specified length or do this for a crossfade? Okay, so let's say if I'm here and I just want it to select let's say the beginning of this file just hit the letter a and you could do like fades to range so let's say i'm at the beginning of this file i hit a that will just do a fade in until that point so if i wanted to you know do a fade in fade out and i select two different events i could come here and hit a and that will just do kind of a fade in fade out uh, so you could just kind of do it like that. And if you wanted to do like for a crossfade, you know, anything that you have overlapping, you could just hit X and that will do the crossfades, but check out. And I think this is fades to range is the name of the function, but just hit the letter a, and that will just do your fade auto fades there. Okay, so a question on comping with cuts. How do you get rid of all the cuts that are made during comping, uh, hopefully without needing to switch to the glue tool? Is there a way to make it so that it isn't making cuts to the audio, but it's just choosing a specific section, like in Logic? It feels very unintuitive currently. So I think maybe, you know, if, you know, make sure that you're using the comping tool. So let's say I have 
uh, all of these tracks uh, laid out for me here, and I wanted to look at comping for this particular lane. So, you know, don't come here and use like the scissors and glue tool, but just use this little hand tool. And this way you could just select kind of the different regions and so, and this will automatically, and I, I find this to be, you know, pretty intuitive. You could select the region, you could come over here, audition each of the regions and just have kind of all of that set up for you. Uh, so you don't have to, you know, do switch between tools. You could just kind of access all these tools, select different takes for that specific area and quickly switch um, just kind of like that. So make sure that you're using the comping tool. So if you're kind of using the scissors, you could do scissors and use the pencil glue tool, but you know, the comping tool is very fast and efficient for that particular workflow. Okay, so let's say uh, if I zoom in on a section and the cycle starts and ends outside of where I am zoomed, it is difficult to create a new smaller cycle of the specific desired length unless I zoom back out because that pencil is the simple way to, um, because of that pencil. Uh, is there a simple way to do this or a simple way to totally remove the loop function so that it's not grayed out? So let's say if I'm here and we have uh, our zoom active and let's say it's kind of off. So I'm not sure if you want it to set a zoom. There's a preference here where we could say, let's go to um, under editing, and I think we could do cycle follows range selection. So if, if this the intention was to just, you know, set uh, a zoom, you know, set new locators, you could just use kind of like the range selection tool and that will automatically set that directly there. So you don't have to do that. Um, is there a simple way or a simple way to totally remove the loop function? and? You could just hit the you know the little slash keyboard on the numeric keypad or just simply come over here one thing that often kind of throws people off also is when we just say i want to i think it might be under transport uh you know clicking locator range uh in the uh, in the ruler uh, activate cycle. So if you wanted it to not turn off or on here, there's a preference for that as well. Okay, so we have a question, uh, how to export current comp to a new track. So really, all you have to do is, let's say I have my comp here. Um, I could just you know, select the events or I could select the track and I could do a render in place. So I could, you know, I could do a bounce audio selection. So if I wanted to come here, let's say I have these events selected, I could do uh, a bounce selection right there and that would replace it. Or we could choose if I just wanted to select like the entire track, come here to go to render in place. And I could even say, okay, I wanted to disable the source tracks or remove the source track so I could just come right there and that would automatically replace it. And if I had effects, you know, we could do that. So you could do a render in place or bounce audio selection. Okay, can we get a question? Can we get a single shortcut to hide, unhide all hidden tracks button? So I think it makes sense that it's gonna be different shortcuts. Uh, so if I wanted to come here, you know, we could have tracks that are hidden. So if we wanted to just say, okay, I don't want to see those particular tracks. And then I want to go to the configurations here to show all tracks. Now it makes sense that, I mean, if you wanted to, you know, do this, but you know, you, you can't necessarily hide tracks, you know, that are, you can't necessarily unhide tracks if they're not hidden, if that makes sense. So I think you could, you know, save between different states, but you know, if you wanted to 
Now hide particular tracks and then show tracks. Once you show all the tracks, then there are no tracks that are hidden to then go back and hide. So it's, you know, it makes sense to kind of split up those functions because, you know, you can't unhide stuff that's, you know, that isn't hidden. Okay, question. Uh, is there a way to turn a tracks on or off in the sense that once it is off, it is, it is not using processing power? So really all you have to do is right click on a track or tracks and choose to disable track and that frees up memory processing and CPU processing, and then you could conversely do the opposite and enable the track. Okay. Okay, so we had a question. Uh, I think my scores editor uh, was writing into late in the chat field on Friday's Hangout. Is there a preset for cleanup? Uh, if not, can Greg show what steps are often required for it to look good? I want... Uh, also that the chords shall appear be shown uh, is it possible to make a macro so a lot of times when let's say i have a part that sounds correct but when i look at it in notation it just looks horrific and is something that you would never want to give to a real musician so what I would do, so this is like a piano part, you know, if you know what the key is of the song, I know that this is in uh, A flat, I'm going to set my key. Uh, I'm And I'm going to do just, this will be like a piano part, so it's going to be a split staff, and we set the split point at C3. And I'm going to just take kind of, you know, the smallest note that I intended to play was an eighth note, the smallest rest I intended was a quarter note. And then I often kind of just check these things. We could save all of this as a preset. So if we wanted to come over here and save this as a preset, like, okay, this is how I want my piano to be. At this point, I'll just hit apply. And then that's the same exact music. But what we did is we quantized you know, and I could say, okay, maybe I want 16th notes and eighth note rests, but I quantize the musical appearance of it without necessarily affecting the actual playback. So at that point, I could just come right over here and quantize the appearance. So that's what I would do to clean stuff up. And if I wanted to, and the other question, how to see the chords in the score editor is if you just go to scores and if you have a chord track, you know, one is you could just come right over here and you could put chords in. So you could say, okay, I just wanted to come to other and, you know, we could place chords in here. Uh, if we have a chord track, we could come directly to the scores and we go to uh, show chord track and that would automatically display the chord track and transpose it and superimpose it rather directly on the score view. All right, so we have another question. This is uh, from Coco, I believe, who's also, you know, who had asked questions before, kind of transitioning from logic. Uh, so we see, uh, while moving audio or MIDI, can Cubase ask whether you want to move automation or not? Uh, can you toggle between it asking whether to move, move it and always moving it? So it's really just a preference. You know, you could set the preference, but you could also go to the edit menu here. Um, so let me just bear with me just for a second. Just... Get my Cubase up here real quick. Okay, so the automation is just gonna be, you know, it's just going to be a setting, you know, usually people want this on by default is just the automation follows events. And that way, if we have automation on and we move uh, events that the automation 
is tied to that. So that's the preferred method for people. But if you wanted that not to be turned on, you could just turn off that check or go into the edit menu and just set up a key command to turn that on or off. Okay, so we have, uh, let's see, can the shortcuts for show all automation show all used automation and hide all automation just be one shortcut? Uh, why are they different? Um, because, you know, it could really depend. So let's say if we go to the automation panel, I could say let's show, uh, so I could say let's show all volume automation. So this will show all auto, all volume automation. And if I only wanna see used automation, I could say, I only want to see, I'll hide all. And I think it makes sense that there are two different commands to show and hide. Uh, but I could also say, I only wanna see tracks that have volume automation where it's used. So like this track may not have volume automation and then it's going to be show me only where we have panning automation or volume automation, or I wanna see volume automation for every single track and to hide the automation. Again, these are all user assignable keyboard shortcuts. And I think it makes logical sense to have that differentiation between automation on or off because you may have, you know, that could be a very simplistic workflow when you get into a lot of tracks. Okay. Um, so question, is there a setting where tracks, both audio and MIDI can automatically delete whatever is under? So, uh, what they are being dragged over, for example, uh, if there's an audio from audio a to bar one to bar nine, I drag a separate four bar audio file over that uh, starting at bar seven to bar 11. Is there a specific setting where Cubase will automatically delete, uh, i.e. trim the audio from bar seven to bar nine on the original audio? So this is just called delete overlaps. And this could be enabled uh, when we go to preferences to editing and you'll see delete overlaps. So now if I wanted to take just a portion of an audio file and drag it over. As soon as we do that, that audio file is overwritten and the original file is kind of erased and it's not there underneath. You could still kind of get that information back, but just enable under preferences, editing to delete overlaps. And then that will behave exactly the way you want. Okay, so let's see, is it possible to trim the end of an audio file to the beginning of the next region uh, with a single key command instead of me having to drag the end handle uh, of the audio file either shorter or longer? This would be both to extend and to shorten. Um, so I think the delete overlaps will kind of do that same exact functionality for you. So let me know if that doesn't kind of work for you. Um, all right, so we see question, uh, is it possible to default Cubase to start audio from the left locator when cycle is activated uh, instead of uh, pressing a shortcut to get to it to the left locator? So, you know, there isn't a preference for that. And I think a lot of people kind of still want the ability to have the uh, you know, the play position. I mean, you could just hit the one key on your numeric keypad or your two key to get there quickly and hit your period key to go back. But I think that just because you have a cycle active in the project that every time you wanted to play, it could be really annoying because you may have the cycle active, but you may not be working on a different part of the project. So there isn't a way that I know of to have that. And I don't think... You know, I think that would annoy me personally, but all right. Okay, so question on uh, super exclusive solo. Is there a setting that I can toggle with a key command that essentially overrides the solo information? For example, if five tracks are soloed and I'm zoomed in on one piece of audio to find out that the, where the noise is coming from, I click on the button and it only activates a solo on that single piece of audio and overrides uh, all the other tracks. So let's say we have a number of tracks soloed here. Um, you know, if I wanted to do that, I would probably just grab the play tool here. And if all these tracks are soloed, let's say, you know, and 
for playing along, I would just play this one particular track. So let me just get this so you guys can hear it. Okay, so now, like all these tracks are soloed, but if I just play just with that, then, you know, only that one particular track is soloed. So, um, all right, so we see mute, unmute all. So mute all five things instead of toggling the ones that are off, the ones that are on to switch. So let's say if we have a number of sources that are muted you could just have the global mute state kind of turned on and off right right here so that way you could just say okay i have you know 40 tracks i could just turn off <clears throat> the global mute state right here okay uh let's see default duplicate uh okay sorry there's another one uh is question is it how to change a horizontal scrolling to command plus shift plus mouse wheel rather than just shift mouse wheel so you know i don't know of a way to change this but if you wanted to just kind of scroll you could just use the shift mouse wheel so you know it i don't know of a way to make it control plus shift mouse wheel uh, but you know, that could be something that's maybe just different than other programs, but I think, you know, using fewer modifiers is faster and it's, I realize that there's probably muscle memory that could still be, um, you know, still be present from other programs, but I think that's actually faster. Question, uh, is it possible to, for the duplicate tracks to default, uh, to be just copying the track in settings, but not the audio MIDI? So, you know, when we duplicate a track, I think it's fair that the track gets duplicated with the events and that makes sense. But if you want to do that, it, it's actually a macro that comes with Cubase. If you go to edit to macros, you could duplicate selected tracks without data and that will do the same thing for you. And you could assign a keyboard shortcut to that macro, but I think it makes sense that by default, the when you say duplicate track, that it duplicates with the events. But if you want to get to the same event, you know, to the same track settings without the event, you could just simply do that. Um, so you see adding take to take folder. Um, is it possible to add an outside piece of audio to a take folder so it could be part of what you're comping. So yeah, certainly. So as we do comping, you'll see that it's always going to be, you always have an extra lane. So I could just kind of take another audio file and just drag it right into, uh, you know, directly into the lane that you want. So you always will have an extra lane kind of just for that particular reason. Okay. All right, and the last question is um, about utilizing VCAs in groups. Um, so I often use instruments in groups like strings, woods, drums. Is okay, I'll put my strings to one group and also there's strings to a VCA fader. So it makes total sense, I think. You know, a lot of people will, you know, how to, you know, when you use like groups and VCAs together, you know, I think it can make sense to automatically assign things to, uh, you know, to a group. And then you could assign, so I could say, let's add a group channel to the selected channels. And then if you wanted to also just kind of, you know, assign, you know, some people will take this and just, you know, assign that group to a VCA as well. So, you know, people, you know, in that way you could have these as, you know, I could treat my, you know, I could use the group to sum and to do processing and use the VCA for, you know, dealing with different automation controls. All right, so I know that we're out of time. I, I know we had a couple more questions. I'll roll those into Friday's Hangout. I want to thank everyone for all the great questions. We hope that some that you all have learned a new tip or trick. Uh, we want to thank all the continued users and everyone for their help in making such a wonderful community here on the Club Cubase live streams. And we look forward to seeing everyone on Friday starting at 1 p.m. Thank you very much.